welcome back to the Glitch Bottle podcast, where we are so honored to welcome back Ed Calderon to talk about lessons learned walking the path with Santa Muerte. How is the veneration of Santa Muerte evolving? What are the deep lessons learned from going public with La Santa Muerte, the personification of death itself? Well, in Mexico City's Tepito Barrio or Tepito neighborhood, what wisdom there does the first public altar dedicated to Santa Muerte reveal to us? Well, Ed Calderon is the best person to ask. Ed is no stranger to the Glitch Bottle podcast because thousands of you have shared comments appreciating Ed sharing his personal connection to La Santa on the last episode. Now, Ed, I know so many listeners, you are familiar with Ed. Ed Calderon has worked in the fields of counter narcotics, organized crime investigation and public safety in the northern border region of Mexico for more than a decade. And Ed made incredibly brave decisions to face down that corruption. Ed's study into the indigenous Mexican criminal culture from occult practices to endemic modus operandi has led him to be recognized as one of the world's preeminent researchers and trainers in the field of personal security that has come out of Mexico. And also, among many, many other things, Ed is the host of Manifesto Radio Podcast, which you can definitely check out in the links below. And also, I'm very proud to support Ed Calderon on Patreon. And so I hope you join us there as well to show Ed some love and support. In this episode of Glitch Bottle, Ed is returning to share about the deep lessons learned about going public with his devotion to La Santa Muerte. And also, Ed will hopefully break some of those misconceptions that religious groups and others might hold about La Santa, as well as offering advice and answering all of your excellent listener questions that you've had for Ed. And with all that being said, Ed Calderon, thank you so, so much for taking the time and stopping back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Thank you for, so much for having me back. Uh, since last time, it's been uh it's been amazing getting um, a lot of feedback, uh, meeting people randomly that uh, knew me just from your show and wow. um, them sharing a little bit about their experiences and pointing me into different directions as far as things that I didn't know about, uh, things that I didn't uh, get exposed to and growing my own uh, knowledge base on this um, very unique faith uh, practice coming out of Mex coming out of my, my home uh my home uh, country of Mexico. Uh it's been it's it, and also the the support that I've received for for basically being public with it uh, has been has been amazing. Oh well that's that's incredible and I I agree Ed. the the cross pollination was amazing. We had grimoireic practitioners and people who study esotericism and I know you and I were chatting about the connections between some of the European magical systems and also La Santa Muerte and absolutely the the honor is mine Ed because you are among many other things obviously a security specialist an instructor a devotee of La Santa but in addition uh, something I hope we get into is you strike me as an alchemist. You are someone who, given the hard lessons, this prima materia of life, you transmute and you share this with others, how to transmute pain and challenges and suffering into these jewels of redemption and healing. And so um, I, I think, Ed, given all of that, probably the best place to start is in recent years. Um you have started sharing publicly. And as you mentioned on, on the, the Glitch Bottle podcast, you shared about this, uh, Joe Rogan and others, about your devotion to La Santa Muerte. Um, in the last few years, what has been your experience as you've been actually sharing publicly about this? What kind of feedback and yeah. reactions have you gotten? Well, I mean, first off, I know a lot of people are public with that faith online and uh, they share a lot of it. And it makes sense maybe for some of their backgrounds. Um I'm somebody that has, you know, government contracts and I teach the military. Um, I've spoken to Congress a few times and uh, I'm a public figure in, in, in a lot of ways. And I move around in a lot of different circles. And this aspect of my spirituality or the faith practice that I have behind me gets brought up every now and then. Um, the United States is a place where um, religion is very much utilized as part of an identity. And uh, 
there was, I mean, there's a lot of spiritual practices in the United States, a hodgepodge of a lot of things. Um, and it's, I bec- it's, it's been both on one end, it's been interesting seeing it uh, received as with interest and curiosity. Uh, and on another realm, you know, I've, I've, I've worked in Hollywood a little bit as well as a consultant and, and, and talked about some of these issues with uh, everything from uh, video game programmers to uh, other types of entities that uh, basically wanted to pick some of these uh, cultural practices in fiction. And it's been uh, it's been a battle. Um, the first introduction to Santa Muerta that most people have in the United States has been through, uh, you know, media like uh, Breaking Bad. And uh, that was the first introduction that a lot of people, uh, as far as popular culture in the United States, had to it. Not just the United States, but across the globe. I mean, we have altars all over the place now. Um, it's been very... You know, it's been a battle. Uh, the immediate connotation of Satanism, uh, of it being a demonic practice, of it being associated specifically to criminal practices and, and cartels, uh, has been something that I've had to battle with. And and both it being utilized as an attack on my person, you know, because I was a law enforcement professional in Mexico, and that means that I was evil and corrupt. And the fact that I had that as a fate practice confirms that for some people or it gets weaponized against me and that uh, for some people and it's it hasn't been easy and i'm not here to complain other people are persecuted by for, uh, for way in a way way deeper and more horrible manners but i have i have made it a point to try and dispel some of the things that are around it as far as misconceptions as far as what it's what people think it is and also not just on the, uh, not just defending it against some of the uh, Christian fundamentalist types of attacks that we see out there, or just ignorance uh, as far as general culture, but also from the occultist community and uh, some of the aspects of people trying to take ownership over a faith practice that is not theirs, it doesn't belong to anybody, uh, but that try to infuse it with their own practices or. Uh, alternative motives and also make a buck out of it. Um, both of these things have been greatly uh, painful to me for me to witness as I go about the process of uh, not only talking about some of these things pu- publicly, but being an advocate for some people that have done and are trying to make this a, a more accepted part of the spiritual and faith practices uh, across not not only Mexico, but the United States. I've, I've visited several of the shrines in the United States, and I make it a point to go to these places and talk a little bit about my experience with this faith practice where I'm from. Um, it hasn't been easy, and it's, uh, it, it, and it's, uh, it's still a, a work in progress. You know, uh, I'm really looking forward, Ed, just to getting into the breaking the misconceptions and just talking about you know a lot of the the ideas that people hold that are absolutely antithetical and and not involved with Santa Muerte at all before we get there though Ed in terms of that courage that you've had to share about your devotion to La Santa um you recently visited speaking of courage the first public altar to La Santa Muerte in Mexico City's Tepito Barrio or Tepito neighborhood. Can you share about not only the importance of this altar and maybe the story about your visit, but also can you share with listeners uh, who for the first time might be hearing about Enriqueta Romero and and that connection? Uh, to Enriqueta Romero or to, to us, uh, Doña Queta, uh, a guardian figure. Uh, this altar has been up in public since the year 2000. Um, it was the first public altar of, of, of that sort uh, made, although you hear stories and and you've and I, and we've I've done a, a, some research and some recent video discoveries have been made of previous uh, public expressions of Santa Muerte. There's a there's a video from the 90s that is on my Instagram account that was shared with me by a an Instagram account called uh, Espiral Morado, amazing Instagram account, by the way, and a TikTok account. You can you can follow that as well. Um, it, where uh, it, it, they, they show in a telenovela a, a a lady doing black magic and invoking the spirit of Santa Muerte, and it's probably the first time it's ever the the statue and the imagery of Santa Muerte appeared in in media uh, somewhere in the nine somewhere in the early nineties. 
Uh, but realistically, nobody really knew a lot about it. It it was something relegated to back rooms, uh, relegated to obscure practices in certain Catholic churches in Zacatecas, uh, where they actually kept a uh, a Santa Muerte figure for hundreds of years, um, and uh, that was later on burned and destroyed by the church. But you you never saw anything outside of that uh, kind of secretive backroom uh, faith practice until Enriqueta, Doña Queta, uh, who, according to some of her interviews and some of my conversations with her, basically found that faith practice through her aunt, who had a small image of her, of Santa Muerte, um, and she would pray to it, and things would happen for her, is how she kind of describes it. Hmm. So she decided to make public a statue and a veneration that she had in her home with an outward facing window. Mm-hmm. And that in the middle of one of the most dangerous barrios uh, of, of Mexico City, Tepito, which is if you people have been down there, it's it's not a not a, not not that not that uh not that welcome in place as far as uh it's 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 it's, it's rife with criminality and 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 then they're very protective about who goes in and out of that place. Uh, I went down there probably 2004, 2005. And uh, when I was down there, I went to one of the altars because it was basically that one sprout started sprouting different ones across the city. You go down, there's hundreds, if not thousands of altars in Mexico City now in the pu- in public. Uh, there's a very famous picture of me that I've shared a bunch of times. It's been a bunch of magazines and stuff like that, where I'm standing in front of a metal a metal fence and two Santa Muerte figures, uh, dual Santa Muerte figures. Kind of the first times I've seen the mentioning of duality practices. You know, uh, on one end you would see um, uh, a, a ground covered with flowers and edible offerings, and on the other side you would see drugs and bullets and knives and pictures of people that wanted to be cursed and stuff like that. It was an interesting aspect of it. Uh, Doña Queta, Enriqueta basically made the first public altar to her. And the faith started growing from there. Um, she had never and has never really dictated how you should pray, how you should venerate, uh, what practices you should have around her. She never came out with a manual. She never made any money by selling books, videos, online courses, or any of that. She had the whole attitude that uh, it's death. Uh, she is part of our spiritual practices. And number one, she's a she's a Catholic lady. Yeah, she has a giant uh, altar set up for Christ and God and the Virgin Mary and La Virgen de Guadalupe and all, all of that. She says, my heart has room for all of these things. Um, so that was the start of it. Uh, that was the start of this, this public facing practice. And like anything that has that popularity and that uh that uh feeling of uh of of a recognition that a lot of people had because a lot of them were like myself had some of this in their religious background already right i grew up as a guadalupano a devotee of la virgen de guadalupe my family i have uh, members of my family who are like high level guardians of la virgen de guadalupe in the in the in the, in the states they're in um there was always the imagery of a skeletal figure behind and around her um, that I I didn't know what it meant or I didn't know what it was about um, till later, you know, I started trying to figure some things out. One thing that I learned about it recently is uh, the practice of carrying the, the figure of Santa Muerte or a, a death figure behind the crucifixion procession during Easter, mm. which is probably where a lot of Mexicans learned about it or saw it first. And since they didn't relate specifically to some sort of occult practice or some sort of veneration directly to death, um, they didn't kind of put the pieces together. But that's where a lot of the imagery and iconography actually comes from. Not all of it, but some of it comes from there. Uh, Enriqueta set this uh, set up this amazing public altar and Every year there's veneration and every day there's people showing up there from across the globe now. Uh, and if you if you go there, it is not what you expect. People will sometimes expect this grandiose temple. Uh, there's other altars out there in Mexico in Mexico uh, that are grandiose and 
you know, sponsored by uh, people with money uh, on both sides of whatever uh, uh, conflict you want. Uh, and they're amazing mausoleum type giant uh, spaces. This is a very humble little house in Tepito with a with an outward facing window. Uh, I went down there a, a few a few months ago, um, and uh, you know you go there. I, I was with a, a federal agent that was there with me, uh, watching my back because I was out there doing a security conference, and uh, and uh, a few kids that are from that barrio. And uh, we were immediately identified as foreigners as as we approached the altar. Um, uh, a few people were walking around us with uh, ill intent, probably. Uh, but we got there, and she kind of whistled at me and said hi, and she recognized me. And I went over and said hi, and everything was fine. Um, it's uh, if when you talk to her, and if anybody wants to go down there, more than welcome. It's safe as far as you know. Just don't disrespect the place, you know and respect her and respect the people there and the faith. Um, she was, uh, she has been basically trying to express to people in all of her interviews and all the different uh, aspects of her presence uh, because she's, she doesn't, she, she's not on social media. She avoids all of that. Uh, uh, how the faith doesn't belong to anybody and nobody has ownership over it. Um, and specifically, and uh, recently she's, been very concerned about a few authors in the United States trying to infuse that faith practice that uh, that has been growing in Mexico and that came out of that specific part of the world with their own ideologies and with their own, I don't know, purposes um, and a lot of lies and a lot of made up and fabricated things about it. Uh, both on the religious side, because a few Christian uh, a Christian uh, p- pastors have gone there and they're down there trying to co- trying to convert uh, co- trying to convert these people, and also on the occultist side, uh, some pretty big authors out there have been writing about it, and sh- people show her the books, and she recognizes none of it as anything that would be part of her practice or the practice of the people that are around her, and I as well don't recognize a lot of stuff that I see out there. That's so two, two things really strike me. One is uh, for both yourself and of course, uh, Donya Keta, the humility and the sincerity to present this raw, accurate, sincere, and unvarnished um, picture of actual devotions to La Santa Muerte. And, you know, I, I remember when, um, uh, one of our mutual colleagues, Laura Davila, Daphne de Leche Fera, she was on the podcast talking about breaking those misconceptions. And I, and I guess, Ed, to your very point about visiting Tepito, you're in the barrio, you are meeting with Doña Queta, you're you're there at, at the first public uh, altar, the first area for a public area for La Santa Muerte. Last time you were on the podcast on Glitch Bottle, Ed, you were sharing about how the government in Mexico, the Catholic Church would destroy in times past uh, Santa Muerte altars, for instance, if they found altars on the side of the street. And so I guess because of a public altar like this in Tepito, is this a sign in recent years, Ed, in Mexico that there might be more acceptance of La Santa by the government and the church compared to decades past, or is it still the same? It, it, it's it's still it's still a battle. Uh, okay. I mean, I um, the faith has manifested itself in different ways uh, mm-hmm. across the country, and one place that I have a lot of familiarity with it is in Tijuana, Mexico, my hometown. Um, where there's a, a a shrine that some people call the resurrection shrine. Uh, it's uh, in front of a it's it's in front of the uh, uh, reservoir in Tijuana, and it has been destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt countless times. It's basically, a pile of uh, rubble. Uh, when sometimes when you get there, and sometimes you get there, it's uh, it's an actual little niche uh, nicho, the pointing towards the uh, sunset, which is part of the symbology behind it. Uh, I've personally rebuilt that a few times myself. Um, it is, it is still, it is still a conflict for people. Uh, it's become more accepted. Uh, there's more people expressing their faith and kind of utilizing that as, as a connection to some of the native roots, which another aspect of it has been, it's, um, 
a lot of a lot of the expression around the faith and a lot of the symbology around the faith has started adding to itself a lot of native or root based uh, cultural elements from the Mexica uh, cultural aspects to just the native aspects of faith practices across the country. So it's been get, it's been getting more accepted uh, in some circles. Um, it has gathered some respect in some places specifically because of the places where some of these faith practices grow the most are some of the most desperate places uh and uh, of mexico where there's not a lot of choices or or, or, or uh when there's not a lot of safety you know people are basically living with death every day that's usually where these th this, these expressions or portals into faith come out and they're defended <laughs> And I mean, going and trying to do something destructive to a public culture that is uh, that are in some of these places, even in Tijuana has a few now that are very, very known. You won't get out of there alive. Uh, it's uh, it, 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 it that's it, some of them have uh, developed that uh, that uh, reputation, and again, it's because they are under attack. Um, you 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 see people in these communities uh, who are devout Catholics. And again, it's another aspect of it that is kind of like alien to me when I go into the U.S. and see how it is in the U.S. Uh, most of these people are devout Catholics, baptized, they take confession, they go to Mass. And this is something that is on the side. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Uh, the church hates it, but it, it there's there's nothing they can do about it. You know, they, the church tries to downplay it. They they call it uh, something that is demonic and evil. But at the end of the day, what is realer, what is more verifiable than death to some of these people that live in some of these communities? And the answer is pretty much that's it's a hard it's a hard thing to to deny. You know, and that is why it's been such a such a powerful element that is that is basically something that we've held on to since pre-colonial uh since the pre-colonial times the death and the devotion to death and life basically a duality has always been with us this is a great time to get into this um there i've seen some traditional catholics uh, more conservative catholics online and one of them said uh, about la santa quote this came from Mexico. It's connected to witchcraft and connected to Satanism. Santa Muerte is honored in the underbelly of the Mexican subculture. It's a Mexican narcotic folk saint linked to narco human trafficking. It's a mockery of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's been popularized by the powerful influence of the Mexican drug cartels, unquote. But you, Ed, and in a totally separate interview and in previous posts, I was reading, you know, you've you've pushed back on this because you you said in a recent interview, quote, a lot of people think this is a cartel faith or religion. And you say, no, Santa Muerte was always there. And you also said it's the faith of the marginalized, the hopeless, and the lost. Who better, you say, to befriend than death? If you are in that environment, unquote. And so I guess, Ed, the, the question is, as we break these misconceptions, what is the disconnect there between, say, in, in more conservative Catholicism, even though, as you say, many people who are practicing Catholics, they do this on the side? Like, why? Yeah. It, it's, what is that disconnect all about? So, I, I mean, the, the whole concept, the, 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 the aspect of it being a mockery of the Lady of Guadalupe, you yeah. know, it, it, that's an interesting one. Um, Guadalupe comes from Spain. Th that that whole imagery that 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 uh, Cortez brought with him comes from Spain. And if you go deeper back, that probably came from Egypt. You know, it's probably ISIS. What we're, we're kind of looking at um, when she when uh, when the Spanish came to Mexico and Hernan Cortez came to Mexico and basically put one tribe against another because we have to come to grips with the fact that Mexico wasn't didn't go through a conquest by the Spanish. The Spanish came and gave us disease and also put us against each other and then mixed us all together and made us who we are uh, as, a, as, a, as a country. Uh, we are Spanish and we are also native blood. Uh, my ancestors were 
uh, part of the one of the tribes that basically some of my, some of my ancestors were part of the the tribe that took down the Mexica Empire. Uh, so, like all of us have a mixture of blood and and, and influences in that. When the Spanish came, they quickly figured out because a lot of the people that were ruling um, colonial Mexico uh, were actually members of the nobility of the Mexica Empire and some of the tribes there because those were the guys that won the war for them. And they were rewarded by being included in the building of this nation. Um, when there was a school, an art school that was developed by some of the monks in, in Mexico, and they basically told some of these, uh, brought in some of these the sons of the nobility in, in, in these areas, and they asked them to make a representation in art form of La Virgen de Guadalupe, the ones that they brought with them didn't match up with the locals, you know? Uh. The one they brought had a scepter and a baby. And these guys were like, nah, we can fix that. And so they started doing their thing. Um, it is a complete fabrication and lie by the Catholic Church that Juan Diego went up into a hill and saw this miracle appearance of La Virgen de Guadalupe, because that's exactly the same miracle that happened in Spain. So it's basically a retold story. Um, it's a complete fabrication that the tilma you see in the in the uh, in the uh, in the basilica is real, or or it stems back to that period of of of, of the conquest. It's completely fabricated. Uh, people that supposedly witnessed it weren't there, according to historical records. La Virgen de Guadalupe originally had a crown, you know, and now it's gone somehow mysteriously. Um, what you see in that image is actually a very beautiful miracle. If you look at the image itself, not the apparition, not the story behind it, none of that, none of that was probably real. What happened with that imagery is native people infused their vision of femininity, of life, of source, of death into that image. You see below her a cherub with eagle wings, which is kind of weird. You know, that's Huichilaposti, the war god, if people don't haven't caught on. You see with her a uh, black sash across her across her waist. That means she's pregnant. She doesn't have a baby in her arm. She's pregnant and she's about to give birth to the war god, which is coming below her from the earth through her into reality to fight the to fight her evil sister and all of the stars that are uh, rebelling against their mother, Cuatlicue. Cuatlicue is the Virgen de Guadalupe. And uh, I, I recently, when I went down to Mexico, I made it a point to go to the to the museum where they have the the big statue of Cuatlicue, which is depicted with two uh, two headed snakes, and it looks like a terrifying image. But she rep it's basically nature and chaos that 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 uh, rep is represented through nature. What they tried to do was basically make something that both sides would agree upon that it was okay to venerate. Uh, and if you go into some of the ways that they believed in some of these spiritual practices, you will see that they were very much, um, you you would see what League were represented in a flowery spring form in the form of Tonatzin. And then you would see her terrible form with skeletal face, hands open and a skirt of, a skirt of snakes. Um, the reason why the Mexican flag has an eagle with a snake in its mouth that wasn't originally the codices that was uh, that was the that the that the Mexica left behind. It had something else in the mouth, but that's a symbol of the Spanish killing the snake or the snake faith that was here. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it that way, you, see, you quickly realize that a lot of the aspects of symbology that the Catholics have been trying to push on some of the populace in, in, in Mexico directly related to that. They're trying to suppress something by trying to hide it, but somehow our, our ancestors were smart enough to codify some of these things in, in that image. So when I see it, I see no conflict. I see it as a beautiful representation of both, both sides of the blood that is going through my veins. And also I see a duality aspect to it. It's very much there to anybody that cares to see it and kind of look into it and, and, uh, gets rid of some of the propaganda and, uh, false narrative and false history that has been put upon us. NASA never investigated that dilemma, by the way. That's why would NASA investigate that? And the, and the fact that there are certain star patterns on there is not a miracle. 
That is your ancestry trying to leave messages behind for you. Right? That's exactly what that is. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, I feel I see no conflict in that. And I know people have trying to attack both my beliefs and beliefs of many people trying to separate both of those things. It's not a rumor. It's not a secret. If you go to Mexico City during the times of celebration, some of the festivals they have around Santa Muerte, it's indistinguishable to the ones that they do around La Virgen de Guadalupe and the Basilica. People are on their knees with a, with a statue, bringing ofrendas and offering a manda or a way of paying for a miracle. I've done it on both sides of it. I feel no conflict. I feel no conflict between both sides. One of them is a death statue, and one of them, one of them is a, a very much a representation of a spring or a life statue. Hmm. Now, when you go back and l l read about the story of La Virgen de Guadalupe, you know, why are you worried? Am I not your mother? Is something she says. She basically tries to comfort uh, her, uh, the, the person that she appears to in, in the story. And it's very much the way that Santa Muerte is treated as a motherly or almost grandmotherly figure. And that's what they call her in some places, La Abuela, the grandmother. Um, so one thing we're kind of rediscovering, it's always been there. And maybe some of our ancestors couldn't talk to each other because there was no internet, there was no uh, social media, and there was no way of kind of interconnecting ourselves. And even today, some of our elders, some of the people that came that uh, were first to publicize or first be pub being public with their faith, they don't talk to each other. Hmm. Uh, you see people in Zacatecas that have, you talk, you go to Zacatecas and you talk to some of the older people there about Santa Muerte, and they have no idea what's going on in Tepito. Right? Hmm. You talk to some of the people that I learned my faith practice from in, in, in Tijuana, in Baja. They didn't know what was going on really in Tepito, and they didn't know what was going on in Zacatecas. Mm. And uh, recently, I've been talking to people in the U.S. side, uh, in the, some of the native communities. Um, Lisa Martinez is one of them. She's an amazing uh, representative of curanderismo, and she is. Uh, I've she she's changed my life. Uh, she I, I, uh, she did some uh, some healing uh, on me and. She's, she's amazing. She shared with me the aspect of the lady in the cart uh, who would walk around, who would go around at night with a, with a bow and arrow. And if you were out too late, she would get you. And some of the iconography and imagery coming out of the New Mexico uh, and some of her ancestry, that's, it's, it's, it, and also the fact that there were also, you know, a monks and, and, and a Catholic presence there uh, during the colonial times. It makes sense that some of this stuff would travel. Um, I think in a lot of ways, this, death effigy uh, and this representation of death in life has been around for a long period, but it's been spread out and, and, and isolated in different parts. And what we're seeing now is all these elements now having a connection through other people and a lot of people trying to make things fit together that are, weren't meant to fit together um, because they grew apart uh, on islands that evolved apart on different islands of communities and, and people and also since it's such a taboo subject and a lot of people don't like talking about it and hit it for a long time because it was vilified and uh, persecuted. Um, and it, it makes sense that a lot of this stuff didn't communicate with each other, but deep down, deep down at the bottom of where some of this stuff originates from and how you see it expressed, even now there are some common truths to it and some common elements to it that you see pop up over and over and over again. Yeah. And I really appreciated you sharing not only your ancestral connection to that, but also breaking these misconceptions that people have. I mean, I, I remember growing up Roman Catholic myself and, you know, learning, you know, Ave Maria, Grazia Plena, Dominus Tecum, but there's a motherly aspect to Mary, but even in traditional Catholicism, you have Mary of the seven sorrows being there at the pres at the foot of the cross with the death of her son. So I appreciate you sharing and breaking those misconceptions because these accusations that get thrown around, like the accusation that somehow La Santa Muerte is involved in Satanism, when actually it is literally, as you've said so many times on this podcast and elsewhere, it's the protection of the marginalized, the people who need a mantle of protection. So I, I yeah. so appreciate that you, um, you breaking that. You know, I've I've tried to collect and rescue and protect certain elements of this faith practice that I 
it's so rare to find things even now in Mexico that are related to some of the older stuff out there. Uh, with me, like, and, and for this podcast, I and I'll I'll uh, I'll share some pictures of it, or people can go on to my Instagram ac uh, account, uh, La Santa y el Monje on Instagram is where I share most of the stuff that I find and a lot of the stuff that I share as far as weird small faith practices that I found. But uh, I'm going to share something with you guys. This is probably one of the oldest uh, Santa Santas that I found. Um, it came from a lady in Zacatecas. Uh, her family was kind enough to basically share it with me. They're now very Christian, so this didn't belong in their lives anymore, sadly. And I rescued it. Um, if you can see it, it's probably from the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, maybe earlier, maybe from the 70s. Um, uh, this lady basically made a dress for it. Um, it's based, or, it's uh, made or modeled around an Aurora uh, model kit of a skeleton. And it, you can see in its hand a cross and a heart, a crucifix, or, a crucifix on her neck. At the top of her head, she has a, a pentagram headpiece, which is pretty interesting. Um, mm. And uh, a horseshoe on the bottom with La Santa there. This is probably cobbled together over decades of faith practices. And it has certain images in the back that are pretty interesting. The purple image of Santa Muerte, which is probably the first commercialized image of La Santa Muerte. What was this used for? People you know, people would say, oh, this was in an altar somewhere. Um, this was made to carry like this. Ah, so That's what this was made for. Uh, <laughs> it was made to march behind Jesus during the crucifixion uh, procession that they have during some celebrations uh, in Mexico. They basically recreate the crucifixion. And if people know about the story, Jesus defeated death and they carry her behind the uh, crucifix. And if you see older altars, and I, like I recently posted one on my Instagram account, a very simple one, you'll see the crucifix in front of death, mm. because that's that's where part of the part of the symbology comes from. From some people using, and I think uh, I think there's a similar one somewhere in a collection in the Philippines, because that it, it's all the way over there, made it all the way over there, the same practice, and I, I, it's probably similar in other parts of the world, but. Uh, a lot of this stuff, there's a horseshoe there covered with red string, which some practitioners of hoodoo might recognize as far as some of the stuff that, that they uh, do. Uh, but you, there's, a, there's a bag of something in there. I haven't touched any of this. I keep everything inside. There's a, and there's a figure of St. Michael, defend us which is an, another commonality you see a lot in imagery of Santa Muerte, early imagery of Santa Muerte in Mexico. And when you talk to all these people, why is, why is that angel there? And uh, well, it's, all of this is designed to ward off the devil. It's mm -hmm. against the devil. It's against evil. You know, um, this whole aspect of how it should look like, what it should be practiced, like what images should be there. Should it be, a straight on representation of death like the our ancestors had mm -hmm. uh should it be the uh the goddess of the underworld uh Miglantecutli uh, is what a lot of people think she is she's much bigger than that she is basically the representation or source uh that came all the way back to from our ancestors and I, it, it's something you commonly see across the globe uh black mother figures uh, kalima you see all these representations of both creation and destruction and chaos and femininity. And I think in Mexico, it really took a big root as far as a faith practice outside of Catholicism or uh, beside it or behind it, basically. Being that Mexico, if you think about it, Mexico, Mexico prays to Jesus probably it's the third or fourth option. <laughs> Everybody prays to La Virgen de Guadalupe because we're we we have the base basis of a faith practice around a femininity uh, spirit. So Santa Muerte makes sense. Uh, it's not a sister faith. It's not uh, a side faith. It is it is a duality. Is what I've figured out for myself, and a lot of people have shown me that aspect of it. Brujeria 
sorcery, uh, black magic, all of these things have used it themselves. And I think a lot of that, a lot of those aspects, specifically with the people that I learned some of my faith practices from, um, they were all, a lot of them were all brujas, you know, uh, just like Daphne, uh, she, yeah. those types, you know, uh, when I say those types, I mean, Daphne was a bruja de rancho, uh, basically, basically like a, you know, a clandestine <laughs> practice or of, of witchcraft and places that are dangerous. Uh, and it was, it was always like, why are, why did they take ownership of this? Or why did we see that with them? Well, because they were trying to ward off the devil and, 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 and they were trying to ward off those evil spirits and they would use death as a, a shield or as a, as a way to protect themselves from anything that uh, negative or evil that was going to try and make a, make a cause effect or damage on them, basically. Um, that's how it started. That's how it first started popping up in some of these faith practices. And then later on, it uh, evolved into what we see now. Which uh, you know they're asking her for everything from a new car to uh, money uh, or a beauty or for somebody to get uh, divorced from their wife so they can marry you like that type of stuff. Which is, I mean, I guess we we can ask whatever we want and uh, this these faith practices will evolve in whatever ways they want. But to to its original form, it makes real realistically makes no sense uh, or doesn't really jive with what it was. Um, there's two aspects to it. I think that you see now the mystic aspect of it, the personal faith practice that a lot of people have basically a momentum mori of a modern sort where people are venerating death in life. And then the aspect of people turning it into Santa Claus and wanting to ask death for everything from a new car to please give me a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Um, both are, have their place. I uh, both have their place and both are, are, or what they are in this in this world, uh, but if you look at it from where what it was originally, it was very much a veneration or a memento mori type uh, faith practice, uh, a veneration of life and death, uh, a pause, a a conscientious relationship with death and life, and realizing what aspects of that have to do with now. I mean, if you venerate death, and if you've been close to death, or if you've died before, and some of us have died in life. You, you you find these aspects uh, very uh, personal and humbling when you start integrating them into your life in a faith practice. Um, I've had many people on my podcast that have come up uh, and spoken about the fact that they, in some way, shape, or form, have death effigies at their houses. They couldn't. They didn't know what the, what to call that practice. They didn't know what it meant. You see now, it's like, oh, you have one too, and you have a structure around it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's not weird. It's not at all weird. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people want to belong to a community, want to belong to something, they want to connect to something, and they are trying to look for rule sets or structure like they would in Catholic faith or what, like what they would find. In, and they want a manual or a book. People are hungry for it. Um, and that's not how it would work in the past. You would learn some of these things by being in a community like that and learning directly. Because these things were not designed to be codified or passed along in text. You go to the Ñequeta, which is probably one of the main representatives of Santa Muerte in Mexico right now, living. Hmm. Because we lost a lot of people. And the first thing she will tell you is that she doesn't belong to anybody. You know, you <laughs> and she doesn't do limpias uh, on pendejos or amarres on pendejos. She says she doesn't do any binds or spell casting. And the first person, that, and, the, and the first uh, spirit she asks for permission is God. And then she works with La Santa, you know, La Flaquita, as she called her, right? Um, I think people are struggling to try and uh, make sense of it for themselves. And people have taken predatory advantage of some of these people in their wallets by selling them books that have absolutely nothing to do with the faith practice as it is or as it was. And uh, people should kind of analyze that, you know, why that is. Um, there's a few ones that have been called out publicly recently, and I don't want to, I don't want to be the one that uh, that uh, makes them even more famous. But there's people should analyze where these books come from, what the intention behind them is, and if they're trying to take ownership or authority 
over these aspects of what it is and what it should be. And uh, these people are predatory. They're trying to take ownership over something that is designed and has survived because it hasn't been able to be codified or written down or put into a box. Right. Absolutely. And Ed, to that very point, you've just shared, of course, about Doña Queta and Tepito and the legitimate sources of public altars. As you said, without mentioning, you know, individual names or authors, in general, for the listeners out there, what are some of the big red flags or things that maybe if people hear someone talking about La Santa Muerte, they need to go, hold on, this might not be legitimate? Like, is it someone coming up to you and saying, I have the secrets of La Santa Muerte and come to my altar and I will show you the codified, you know, 72 step process or like, what are some of the big red flags that, that you want people to be aware of? I mean, realizing first and foremost that it's a clandestine faith practice, you know? Yep. So anything that says like, Oh, I have a, I have a, a, lin- a, a, some sort of faith practice that was inherited to me by this person. And these are the writings and this is the Bible of the Santa Muerte. And this is the, this is the specific way you do this and that. Right. Um, so small things like, okay, candles, yeah. Uh, faith candles and of, of that, uh, of the nature that we see now aren't that old, you know, candles were completely different in the past. How they would do, how would they do it in the past? You know, mm-hmm. statues, resin statues and, and, and loaded resin statues are also something pretty recent. Uh, something like uh, this, which was gifted to me by Doña Queta, which is a beautiful statue. Wow. Um, yeah. Has an eye in the, in, in the heart, which is you know, pretty, again, symbolism is imbued into these. Yeah. Um, some of the first ones that were made of like this one were probably from the late 80s to early 90s. And okay. the people that were making these, before these, they were making Buddha statues. These fat, uh, these the, the, the fat Buddha statues of uh, basically uh, uh, to call business and money into your life, which were very popular in Mexico. Daphne speaks about, about these, uh, some of these practices in her book. Um, that, that's why some of these, even, even the one that I just showed you, this, uh, the, the, the bigger one has fat Buddha statues at the back of it. Uh, it's because they didn't have anything else to put on there. So they were trying to figure out how to cobble together this expression of faith for pe- that what people would recognize. Uh, how can we make people realize that Santa Muerte will bring benefits into your eco- into your life economically? Hmm. Well, just put one of those fat Buddha statues in the back of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a grassroots clandestine faith practice. It takes its, uh, takes its symbolism, takes its tools of faith from wherever they can get it. Um, so uh, I've seen statues made out of bone. Like uh, my personal one is made out of uh, bovine bone, I think. Um, it's pretty old. Wow. Uh, I've, this one is made from an Aurora uh, model kit uh, skeleton from the from the seventies, probably. Uh, so there's no specific recipe. So anytime you see anybody giving you a specific recipe over construction, or a specific recipe of how an altar should be set up, um, th- th- you should kind of like really look closely at why that is and and if it's a rigid state then go to mexico and travel around and you will see altars of all types and shapes from roadside giant ginormous altars of the santa muerte in her more native role with a penacho on her with a headdress made of feathers which is actually some a very modern thing and you will also see her with a mirror instead of a face so when you look at her you're looking at yourself Mm. So, which is the real one? Which is the authentic one? Is this the one authentic because it came from the Niketa with a glass eye in the middle of the chest? Mm. Or is another one a, a more authentic because it's older? Uh, people trying to codify these things, people trying to, again, put it all into a, into a box or a reference. Those are the people that I think you should, you should question it, is what I'm saying. Um, there, are, there are small elements of faith practices that I've seen commonly that are very old that I see in it. Mm. Uh, but they're all very specific and, and related to where they, where some of these faith practices came up in Tepito. It's commonly said that you need to have three statues in your life, one gifted, one bought and one stolen. Right. Right. And that is, <laughs> when you think about that, Oh, okay. Who else? I haven't seen that in the U S 
nobody nobody really talks about that in the U.S. at all. I think I'm one of the first pr- people that kind of bring it up publicly in the U.S. and in English in English format. Yep. Um, are we all supposed to go and steal a statue, <laughs> or are we all supposed to get gifted one or earn one? I don't know. Uh, I have a nine year old, and she's learning about this faith practices, and I'm and I'm, I'm giving her this faith to her and. She already stole one, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, but there was a lesson behind it, you know. Uh, the way I learned it from the people that I learned it again, some 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 people that are not with us anymore hmm. from Mexico City that taught me some of these things. I actually went to the the altar where there's a giant uh, in Mexico City. There's a giant uh, Santa Muerte statue. I think one of the biggest ones in the world. If you go there, it wow. was it, that altar was made by a criminal. Uh, uh, who would sell narcotics in the area, and he made this place of faith. Uh, there's a picture of me with some federal agents outside of this place. Basically, they were there venerating, and we're, they were venerating next to the drug dealers. And it's a place where there's peace, right? You can't do anything there. Um, a lady there shared with me that the reason you're supposed to steal one is because faith, this faith in and of itself is a risk. And if you're not willing to take that risk of stealing one of these statues or of taking one like that, uh, you're not you're not really in that faith for real, because there's a danger, an inherent danger of this faith practice that is kind of infused into it. So there has to be a proof of faith, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's stealing it, uh, making money and being productive to earn your ability to buy one. And also making connections in a community around faithful people that will produce or manifest a gifted one. And I think it's a beautiful, all-encompassing uh, arc or journey for people to take if that's what they want to do. That's not the only way. Um, people can do acts of, of self-sacrifice or service uh, in, in, in a way as well. Uh, but I think what it teaches you or it shows you is death is is on everybody's side mm. so if you're looking for fairness if you're looking for favor if you're looking to be you know outside of that rule set you're 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 fooling yourself uh so it's it's, it's very much a way of them to kind of teach that you know she'll steal your time she'll steal she'll gift you time uh or you earn time You know, all of these things are in that faith practice in that symbolic way. Now, again, does that mean that's how everybody should practice it? No, but it's an expression. Um, Another one that I've shared recently that I've I've seen in a few places is that they will, uh, the statue that they, that they use to venerate. uh, If you ask for something and you don't receive it, Hmm. or if you're denied that thing that you asked for, be it a, a family member to survive an illness, uh, to get, uh, I don't know, to get this this job or employment. Another aspect of it that I also you be careful what you wish for aspect of, of, of the older school Santa Muerte practitioners, they, they really sit with what you're going to ask for because she'll give it to you or she'll deny you in a very specific way is what I've heard, you know? Mm, yeah. If you don't get what you wanted, you turn the statue around. So its back is facing you. Mm. And I, I, I always found it weird when I would go places and I would see a statue facing the wall with the back towards the, 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 the practitioner or the person venerate. And I've seen this a few times, uh, different practitioners, again, older women, which is who I take my, most of my notes from. Um, it is a sign that it was denied to you like a mother denies you candy. Or like a mother denies you something that you wanted, she'll give you her back. She'll give her. She'll give you her back. She'll because she doesn't want to see you see how it affects her or trying to con her into giving that to you. So it's very much a representation of a mother denying a child. Right. That's what yeah. it. That's that's the symbology of it. And you're supposed to turn it back around when your heart stops having the pain or want for what was denied. So mm. it's a grieving process that is infused in that sim- symbol faith practice. Um, when you see it expressed, I mean, people want to imagine this happening in a Santa Muerte temple somewhere in the hills and people making all these ceremonies. This is something that's happening in a back room, in a room of a house somewhere that is 
the maybe the maybe the walls are made out of garage doors, you know. Maybe the only thing they're going to have for food there is going to be ramen noodles and and sardine cans. You know, mm-hmm. this is this is a clandestine, popular faith practice that is practiced both by people like that and it's also some people that actually pay uh, for favors in, in in silver, silver coins, uh, silver bullion, uh, gold bullion uh, gets left in some altars. So you have both extremes now. Um, but again, the whole aspect of people trying to codify it. People trying to say, this is the way you do it. This is the prayer. Um, you know, there's a few Santa Muerte Bibles and Santa Muerte prayer books out there that have been made in the past. And when you go and research some of these, it's from the first people that tried to make money off the faith practice. And some people that later on were sour with Doña Queta and there was a rupture or a schism between some of these people because, again, people tr- saw the money and they tried mm-hmm. to. So that's where the Santa Muerte Bible comes from. That's where some of these prayer books come from that are, and you, you take them down to her and ask her about them if she recognizes any of them and she'll say, nobody owns this. Yeah, that's, it It seems to me that everything you've shared at is that there is a natural, she, La Santa Muerte is inherently organic, very clandestine. And also there's this aspect of, like you were mentioning, something that you steal, something that you're given. There's a personal buy-in here where it is, it's not like there's, you know, well, Santa Muerte applies to everybody in the same way. This is a deep, can you talk a little bit, especially as you are constantly traveling, you're on the road, you know, security talks and, and, and travels. How do you on the road maintain that very personal, whatever you can share, that very yeah, yeah, personal yeah. connection to La Santa. Uh, I mean, one and people have seen people have seen me do this, uh, and they're always like, "What's going on?" Um, I go to a gas station and I buy a pair of cigarettes and I leave it out for people for people as an offering because tobacco is like a traditional offering that we've had. But it's no good if you give it to a statue. You're supposed to give it to representations of life in death or a death in life. So people around you. Um, so that's, hmm. that's an aspect of faith that I have. Uh, and I, and then I try and perform constantly when I'm on the road. Um, there is a symbolic nature that I have, has been shown to me and I've seen pop up several times. Um, there is a Santa, there was a Santa Muerte altar that I visited out of all places in Connecticut. Um, uh, Santa Muerte spiritual beginnings. I think they go by on Instagram and shout out to them run by an amazing lady. Um, it was mind blowing to me that it was that, 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 that uh, was out there. Um, and the first thing I told her was like funny that the, uh, the place that she was at was 13 to 13 as a, as a number uh, the place was a 13 number. It was a pretty fascinating thing, but mm-hmm. the, uh, the road that it was on was in a Y shape. And if you mm. see, it's a commonality of Y shapes being utilized to place altars or to put uh, ceremonial things around Santa Muerte there. And that Y shape is very much an indication of femininity mm. or p- part of a symbol of femininity. So if you find any Y shaped streets out there while you're walking around, it's a good place to leave an offering. You know? wow. And again, these are things that I've learned from old school practitioners that uh, I see them do something like, why are you doing that? Well, this is where she, this is where she manifests. You know, or this is this is where she would, this is where she would have, this is where she would appreciate it, I guess. Um, dogs and r- dog rescues and anything related to canines mm-hmm. are also a big aspect of this for some reason. Uh, probably related to some of the beliefs, uh, native beliefs of uh, the dogs guarding the underworld <laughs> and uh, <laughs> to be kind to them. So I have a. a there's a guy in um, Mexicali who runs a very, uh, very cool dog rescue because he he'll break into fucking places to rescue some of these dogs. So, um, Ruelas, Ruelas on uh, Ruelas on Instagram. Mm. Uh, he runs a, an amazing dog rescue out of Mexicali. He's a he's a devotee as well. Mm. Uh, and it's it's be kind to dogs, <laughs> feed dogs, uh, uh, if, if figure out ways of helping uh, helping dogs and just giving them acknowledgement. Uh, Again, they're a representation of the underworld. So basically, find in life things that have a symbolic representation of death and the underworld. And I mean, I I clean graves every now and then in, in Tijuana at the cemetery. Uh, my mom taught me that if you're not good to the dead, what good are you to the living? So 
Mm. Um, again, different different ways, different methods. Um, I like walking gravesites myself and just leaving uh, offerings to, to, to people that I, I find some sort of commonality with. It's not necromancy. I'm not looking to work with the dead. Right. Uh, but, you know, knock on the door before you go in. Mm-hmm. And if, uh, leave yeah. an offering, you know, leave some smokes, leave some alcohol. If you can figure out somebody there, if you're visiting a family member, adopt another one. It might be an abandoned grave. Um, I take my kid grave cleaning every now and then at the mm-hmm. Tijuana Municipal Cemetery. It's some of the tradition that I uh, that I found through my mother. Um, again, this whole aspect of momentum mori, you know, remember you have to die, uh, mm-hmm. is something that is very much at the core of my personal practice and the practices that I've seen from some of the people that are utilizing it, not as a way to work or cast spells or try and curse people or trying to keep from getting cursed, or but as a personal faith mm-hmm. and as a more of a mystical experience for themselves and how they work with it. You know, that that's one side of it, the personal faith aspect. That's what it was. There was no Santa Muerte temple in the past where everybody would gather in robes to share their knowledge base. It right. was somebody doing something that they learned from their grandparents or their, their grandparents and expressing it in a public manner. And somebody else on the other side that learned the same thing and knowing nods and mm-hmm. maybe a handshake and, a, and, and, and some appreciation of that. And it, it continuing on until the year 2000 when it finally made a portal for itself into the public consciousness through that uh, altar in Tepito. And, and it is one of the, again, I've gotten messages from all, the, all over the world of you know, altars in Russia and France and Germany. Uh, it's wild. Wow to see. Wow. That's incredible. I've been, I've been taking some notes here because there's so many amazing uh, cross pollination points that you're making. And one of them, Ed, this just popped into my head, but you mentioned, I think in Tijuana, you said a few moments ago that because sometimes, unfortunately, these altars get destroyed, you've been, you've been there repairing and rebuilding an altar. Of course, I'm sure it depends depending on the altar, but what does it take to rebuild an altar? How do you even go about that process? I mean, what are the materia that you bring? How do you yeah, how do you uh, do that? Again, clandestine, so there's mm-hmm. no specialty material. You're not supposed to get the right cement from someplace or because again, it's it's grassroots. So right. uh brick, red brick is great. Uh brick. Okay. red brick is great. Uh if you can find it or muster it, that's something I've seen commonly utilized. Uh, cinder block is the material, the, the preferred construction material of all <laughs> Mexico. Everything's made out of cinder block. Um, nice. Elements that I do see uh, that are common uh, is iron, iron bars or iron gates of some sort being placed in front of the altar or around it to protect it. Uh, that's like a commonality that I've seen. Um, figuring out where it's orientated, and I've seen different orientations expressed in different places, but Things that I've seen as common things and have not been expressed to me as essential. If you can find a road with a Y in it, mm-hmm. that's one. Um, if you can find something that is facing water or facing out over the water is another. Mm. Uh, and if you can find something facing facing the sunset is another. Even the one that I have at my at, at my home is facing towards the sunset. You know, um, mm. it's a symbol of death if you kind of think about it you know the the fact that it's setting um yeah um if you can find uh if you can find the reason i think the reason why it's near a water water source is because there's some old probably pre pre uh colonial tradition of cleaning these effigies with water both rainwater or running water or cleaning them in rivers i think there's something some sort of weird connection there probably Hmm. um other than that uh Statue, an effigy, uh, candles, uh, cigarettes, tobacco, honey, cinnamon, um, and flower offerings uh, or or, or elements of of sharing offerings in the form of flowers. Uh, Roses, apples Mm -hmm. are also commonly uh, shared there. Coins and money are left as offerings. Alcohol. Uh, alcohol dumped on the ground, which again, people, this is for my homies aspect of that culture. Again, f- to feed the dead. Uh, a weird specific, not weird, but unique one. I haven't, I haven't really seen it in the U.S. that much. 
uh, is the, if you go there and there's dried flowers or mm-hmm. dead flowers, you're not supposed to grab them and throw them away. You're supposed to flip them upside down. And I don't know where that comes from or what the meaning of that is, but it's a very prevalent thing in, in, in some of the older, you know, popular uh, altars where they flip mm-hmm. the flowers upside down and leave because death and decay is an offering, not just the flower. So you're right. So you, you're not supposed to, because you're supposed to, it's death and life and life and death. You're supposed to flip them. It's another aspect that I've seen a lot uh, shared out there. And a really not that common one is silver. Mm. Uh, every now and then you get offerings of silver and a, like a, see that one oh this wow one. yeah and you can see the flower offering is upside down and it's kind of like going onto the ground so wow. silver mm-hmm. silver and uh you'll see um you'll see silver mexican pesos and silver uh every now and then some people who are, are wise to this will try and dig around some of those altars to try and dig them up and you know buy drugs with that money which again that in itself is an offering you know, you're leaving something there that is going to be consumed by whatever representation or manifestation there is in life of death. And a junkie is a pretty good one, you know, because it's yeah. he's representing something that is almost at the end. So that is a representation. Carry on birds are a representation of that. Uh, elements like that, you'll see, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you leave offerings in honey, it'll attract rats at mm. night. And what do you think feeds off the rats at night? owls huh. yep and that's why you see owls around some of these uh that's why you see owl representation and iconography in some of these places i know they represent the night and there's a bunch of other aspects of it that represented but some practitioners like oh yeah leaf off with like food like well, there's gonna be rats yeah and there's gonna be eaten by owls and that's her so yeah things of that nature that is what you kind of commonly see well and to that very point and um Speaking about the shrine, I believe you mentioned in Connecticut that you saw, uh, we have some great listener questions for you. And to that very point, uh, we have a listener question from Glitch Bottle patron Claudio. And Claudio is saying and asking, I'm so excited, Ed, when I first heard you on the Glitch Bottle podcast, your story was so inspiring. Thank you for being a voice of La Santa and sharing your experience. My question, Claudio says, is what advice, Ed? Would you have for someone who lives in rural America, far away from any public shrines of Santa Muerte? Do you have any tips for those who perhaps want to build their own private altar or have a private devotion to La Santa? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, for me, there doesn't need to need be a public altar because for centuries there weren't, there wasn't a public altar, and people would figure out how to do it. Uh, there's a there's a there's a term that I've heard a few times. It's not that common anymore. But it, it, you, stealing glory or robándose la gloria, mm. basically people hiding uh, hiding their uh, Santa Muerte prayer cards uh, behind a Catholic prayer card, and you can go into the church, mm-hmm. or people hiding a prayer card of this nature inside of a candle behind the label of another, you know. So that's a very clandestine way of stealing the glory. Um, and again, I think it has something to do again for this rebellious aspect and clandestine aspect of the faith practice uh, of how it hides itself and how it uh, manifests itself in, in some of these ways. Um, a practice doesn't need to be known by everybody. It could be a private one. Most of the more knowledgeable and older practitioners that I've met, you wouldn't know. There's nothing on them that would tell you that they are a practitioner. So mm-hmm. it could be both a faith practice that is public and a both one that you express to the pe- to people out there. And I, I did the private in the background faith practice myself for years. Mm. I was working for the government and back then it was, uh, it was very much not a cool thing or, or, or anything you would share publicly to talk about some of these things. And I'm living in an amazing age where I'm talking to a bunch of people now online with, about it. Yeah. Um, I'd say find an find an effigy or find something that speaks to you specifically. Um, if you can construct it yourself, that's amazing. I've seen people make their own. 
Uh, there was a lady that made one out of a tree that got hit by lightning uh, out of wood. It was beautiful that you can see in that uh, image that I posted recently. At least that's what she said it, it came from. So I don't know. Wow. Uh, but uh, if you can find basically an element or a statue that speaks to you, and it could be whatever it is, you go out there, you'll see a myriad of imagery. I'm not here to codify colors for you guys. Again, there's people out there that will codify it for you, and they will say this color means that, this color means this. Uh, I was shown two colors specifically, well, three. Uh, white, uh, purity. Mm. That's the end of the spectrum of a process. And the one that I have right now is white, and I had to earn it. Uh, but when I first got introduced to it, I got a black statue and because I was going, uh, because I was involved in a very risky, uh, activity. So I needed protection. So black is how she manifested in my life. Hmm. Um, I made a few deals with her as far as, uh, healing and giving, uh, being able to be here for a longer period of time than I originally thought, because I basically did, the longest uh, attempted suicide in history, probably from my from when I was thirteen till all the way till I was thirty nine ish, yeah, thirty nine. Um, and I almost I almost dragged myself to death after I left the job. So when I finally gave that up, I I said if I if I leave alcohol, I will be more public with my faith, and I will finally earn my white statue and. When I went to Mexico City, guess what she gave me? <laughs> this white <laughs> statue, right? Um, I don't know if I don't. I don't know. Again, we can look for patterns in our lives, and if it brings us comfort, it could be real. It could be not real. I think find something that has meaning to you, mm -hmm. as far as what you're going to put in there, put on there, and make offerings from the heart. Make offerings that are really manifested through your work and through your life. Um, make offerings in the form of acts of kindness. Um, you can give her a thousand dollars in cash and leave it in front of her altar. But remember, this is in the Catholic church. That's uh that's their game plan. You know, that God is always strapped for cash, not death though. She, she has no need for it. She's at the foot of the ladder. She doesn't mm -hmm. need any cash. Um, yes. And if you want to express devotion, you know, what you, what you, what, uh, what makes your mother uh, happy uh, that you buy her, this expensive jewelry or that you make or something handmade when you're a nine-year-old uh you make something from the heart you know i i know that i treasure my daughter's gifts more when they come from her when she made them for me that's it's the best expression of the love that i can that i can find so bring that into your practice i would say um and remember that she is not something that lives in a closet or not something that lives on an altar she is a natural element that is around us every day. So anytime you find her expressed in nature is I think that's where you, that's where you leave an offering, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, every now and then I, I, if there's something happened in a bad place and if, if somebody lost their lives, uh, I'll carry a candle and I'll leave the candle there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if somebody, if I have to go to a funerary service and somebody passed, passed on that is a friend of mine, I will leave an offering there. Um, and uh, again, this practice has been, is alive because of personal practices, not because of witchcraft people utilizing for sorcery, not because people have been utilizing it to fight each other in magical duels or uh, or some sort of uh, occultist, uh, occultist weaponry that is reserved for only the initiated. It has survived to, to, to our age from people desperately looking for comfort in the form of death and life in a, in a lot of ways. Virgen de Guadalupe, La Santísima Muerte, you know, they're, they're basically two sides to a coin if you look at it. And people have get, get, gathered and carried that in their collective subconscious for, for, for years, probably till our, till our, uh, till now. Now it's, now it's public. Now it's known. And now the gold rush is here and everybody's trying to sell their, their own version of it. <laughs> well, I, I really hope the listeners appreciate this as much as I do, Ed, about your themes here. I've just, I've just, I'm, I'm getting these amazing themes of it's, it's about service, it's about redemption, and it's about sincerity and approaching things from the heart. And I love that with your nine-year-old daughter, you were mentioning, you know, hey, if, if, if she makes something that comes from her, 
as a parent, you just, you know, must just be so filled with joy as opposed to, and and we see this in occult areas too, where someone, oh, someone wants to spend $10,000 to get the best, you know, most esoteric items, but what's more valuable that or making something with your own hands, you know, digging into yeah. the clay, into the earth, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, my, I, whenever I need something, um, or whenever I want to make a real offering, I look for a woman that has had kids in her life. You know, uh, mm. I prayed for healing for years. I prayed for healing for years. When I say healing, I mean, I just come, I just got off of alcohol. Uh, I basically did it the, 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 the dumb and stupid way. Don't do this. Don't go gold Turkey and hide and go into a, and walk yourself into a cabin somewhere. That's the worst way you can do it. That's how I did it. Um, and uh, I thought that was going to get rid of everything. And it uh, it only made me clearer as far as the damage that I've done to myself and the damage that I've done in general. Uh, mm. I, pr- I prayed for, you know, peace. I prayed for healing. I prayed for some sort of salvation. And uh, I looked for it, you know. Uh, I did. I went to places and they did limpias on me to try and clean off Mm. whatever you know and i would never take olympia or never do any of that unless the woman was there unless it was a woman and unless it was a woman that had had kids because that's mm. the clearest real representation of death in life a, mm. a woman that has kids mm. and uh i remember meeting uh, lisa martinez uh and uh and uh she has an amazing son who is also a practitioner. Uh, I saw them both. Uh, I documented them setting up a Santa Muerte altar at uh, Ritual Craft in, in Denver uh, before before I went into a full session with her for the first time. Um, and it quickly dawned on me while she was uh, constructing this beautiful uh, Day of the Dead altar uh, there that she was the clearest representation of death that I could find uh, for myself at that moment. Uh, we did a platica, uh, like I, I interviewed her for, on the podcast, and uh, people can find that on YouTube, um, where I kind of deconstructed some of the aspects of my pain and what I've been through. And then she worked on me for a for an unforgettable session um, that was life changing. Um, re- in reality, there is no magical aspect of it. There's no miracle aspect of it. All she did was make me face the reality of things. And that's what death is. She is a boundary. She's a boundary event. If you look at her, uh, and you look at her nature and, uh, there's a big reason why a lot of these Santa Muerte shrines have mirrors instead of faces because they make you look at yourself. And if people really look at the face practices should be, and as it has been in the past, it is a personal faith practice about reflection and self-reflection and realizing that we're not immortal. We're not perfect. We're not, we're not eternal uh, as far as our physical, uh, our physical vehicles. Um, and that she is waiting for us at the stairs. And that's, that's another reason why you see representations of her with us, where the ladder around next to her, it comes probably from that, that she is at the stairway to heaven. You know, she's at the foot of that stairway. Um, again, this this whole aspect, the, the, the reason why I'm explaining some of these and mentioning Lisa um, is because uh, she and a lot of people out there who are actually doing a lot of physical and 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 and, and, and physical, not only physical work, but they're putting in the effort to conserve uh, aspects of curanderismo that stem from like. Who knows how how old some of these practices are? Um, they're not uh, they're not just blowing literal smoke up your butt. You know, they're not just uh, waving things around and 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 doing things that are symbolic. Uh, they're guardians of something that is older than 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 us, probably. Um, and I personally like to always try and figure out what the clearest representation of death in life is in and around me when I want to make an offering or when I want to ask for something or when I'm looking for healing, you know, 
Um, if you go into the ocean, that's a representation of source. That's mm -hmm. a pretty good representation of death as well. You know, going in and out of the water is another pretty good representation of death and life. So that's why you see a lot of it. Uh, and in some of the older Santa Muerte practices, like the ones that I was exposed to, actually being buried alive mm -hmm. in, in in as a part of initiation into or a present or them presenting you to the um to some of the spiritual aspects of it is it, it makes sense why that's the symbology uh around it um an, a recent discovery that i mean not recent but it's, it's been a few years uh the use of uh the tura flower and mm. seeds in some of the older initiation practices of santa Muerte, like the one that i went through for a long period of time i thought i was given uh I thought that it was dosed with, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, peyote or something like that. Oh. But, ap but apparently what I was given was the tura. That's what I was given. Uh, uh, how how they prepared it or the details behind that died with some of those ladies that uh, were taken by COVID. So I'm, I'm not too mm. certain or sure, but I, I, I'm sure people can kind of investigate and see something. It's a horrible, dangerous drug. Don't Don't ever do it. Uh, but uh, it's present in in some of these practices, and it probably it's again it's probably just native practices that it stem back to millennia. It's a common flower in, in the in the in the region, so it makes sense that they would use the tools that were available to them. Again, there's no codified anything. There's no specific set thing of doing things. People are doing using what they have on hand in the region that they're practicing these faith practices, and on my end, the tour flower. And that's what the, what was available here. So that's amazing. Um, something you've said a few times, Ed, and something that uh, Laura Davila, Daphne Leche Thera mentioned as well is preserving the wisdom from generations past. And you've you've mentioned talking with older practitioners, you know, synthesizing things, taking in their wisdom. Since COVID, has it? Have you seen in in recent years, in in the last few years, that the kind of old school, old guard really is fading out in some areas. Yeah. And do you see yourself as someone who is kind of, you're preserving that tradition in a way? Uh, uh, so one, I'm, I'm an example of somebody that's continuing on a practice. I'm, I don't see myself as a teacher. I'm not going to do an online course on how to do any of these things or, right. but, uh, I see myself as a practitioner, an example of somebody that learned it from people that learned that were practicing it in secret in the past. Mm. So I have some of that in my in my practice. Um, it has been one of the most gut wrenching things to see a lot of generations that I learned from basically get eaten by COVID and by other things, just age and time. And what was lost with them. Mm. Um, I've rescued what I could. I protected what I could uh, from the devotional objects that I've gathered uh, and things that I found uh, on my uh, in my travels. People didn't know what they had, and you, sometimes you would find uh, you know estates, uh, not estate sales, but basically you, because Mexico doesn't have state sales. Uh, basically, somebody died, and they leave, leave their things outside. Uh, one of one of I have a a music box. A altar that has a Virgin Mary inside of it. Uh, and again, if you, anybody wants to see all these objects, they're on my Instagram account, La Santa y el Monque uh, on Instagram. Uh, it's a music, it's a, a wooden music box. You would see it, you wouldn't bat an eye at it if you, if you looked at it. It's very modest, made, cobbled together by somebody. Uh, it has a, a light, a lit up uh, blue light inside of it with a, a Virgin Mary inside of it. But when you look at it straight on, you will see three images of Santa Muerte in the background when you turn the light on. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a devotional artifact of La Santa when it was still a hidden practice. Mm -hmm. And those aspects of what are what I'm trying to rescue to pass on at least as a reference point. I know that it's not what it is now, mm -hmm. but it was that. And people need to kind of analyze a little bit of what that those things mean and how it relates to the way we're doing things now. I think there's an importance there. Uh, Christianity doesn't look anything like it probably looked like when it started. 
And I think a lot of them would kick them. A lot of Christians right now would die to figure out exactly how they would did things back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) just like happened with them, there was reformations. There were people coming in, putting in their own thing in there. And, and now it's what it is, you know, and people, Christians are the most unchristian, like uh, uh, the most unchrist like people sometimes, you know, Christ was a gangster. He was anti-state. He rolled around with a gang of people, you know, they were after him, you know? So that was, I mean, that's when people ask me if I believe in Jesus. Yeah, he was a gangster. I do believe in Jesus. I accepted him in my heart, but he was a gangster. (laughs) Uh, I think that aspect of it is in Santa Muerte is something that's being lost, you know, the gangster aspect of the faith and why it survived to our day. People speaking about decolonizing this faith practice are missing the point. Yes, horrible things happen during colonization. It's a horrible thing. Past was bad, very bloody, very difficult. But how are you going to tell these ancestors of ours that they were wrong for hiding their faith practice within Catholicism? Mm -hmm. How are you going to strip away that aspect of it? Right. Uh, There's no way. You can try as you will to get the most purified, elemental, basic set of Santa Muerte as it was probably like when it first popped into somebody's uh, head, I guess, or heart or spirit, or how it manifested for the first time. And it's going to be basically a duality goddess of some sort, a source mother goddess or grandmother goddess of some sort. And we see her in the Black Madonna. We see her in Isis. We see her in Kali. We see her in a bunch of other uh, uh, manifestations and forms. So realistically, that is what you would have at the end if you stripped everything away. And it's a beautiful thing. That's nothing wrong with it. It means that we're all connected. And it means that we are all basically in this together as a as a people. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. For me, it, there's no conflict. Uh, but on the other side of it, you see this faith practice as it is now and people dying literally to keep it alive till our day hmm. and fought tooth and nail to keep it free, to keep it outside of authority of the church, to keep it outside of ownership by anybody. Hmm. And the elder represent- representative of the faith that I personally see as the reference point right now. And when I say reference point, I mean, she's not the, she's not the authority. She's not going to give you a game plan or a rule set or anything like that. Doña Queta is constantly repeating the same thing over and over again. Nobody owns it. This is, this is the, for the people. This is, you know, th- those books that are written by that American author out there, there's written hundred, uh, dozens of books around uh, on this, who she called out directly, is doing a horrible disservice to people by spreading this concept of it as a business and trying to take ownership over something that, that he has no business owning because that's completely uh, against the faith practice itself. Mm-hmm. So on my end, I, I like to think of, uh, I like to think of this as a, uh, as a, as a traveling, uh, as a traveling saint. And some of the older iconography I've shared with people have, uh, a Santa with her scythe on her shoulder, walking side, uh, walking sideways, looking at you. It's a very old representation of La Santa. I've asked a few people about it, uh, different stories behind it. Um, most people view death as a destination, but we should look at her as a companion because she's with us always. Mm. Um, and as an immigrant myself, and as somebody that has now tried to basically come into a new land and figuring things out out here, having her travel with me was, is, is, is part of my experience. Uh, finding her in the U S completely unrecognizable Um, and seeing how people have made a mockery and or a business of her is another aspect of it, both on both sides of the border, not, not, not just in the U S. But she is 
I mean, she, she is a, she is a, th- this representation of movement and 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 how how some of these ideas have traveled. It's it's a uh, it's fascinating to me that you can see her presence in places where people like myself have made it to, and they bring her with with them. And now I see practitioners all over the world recognizing something elemental and probably something that lives in our collective subconsciousness, which is this female source figure of death. Um, cultural appropriation aspects, people trying to gain ownership of it uh, that are different ethnicities. I have no issues with people from different ethnicities owning it. I don't like taking, when I say owning it, taking it as a faith practice is, it's a beautiful thing. I've had a few people on my podcast that have spoken publicly about their faith, like Josh Burnett, the youngest UFC fighter, um, uh, champion, uh, an amazing man. Uh, uh, he has a, an altar to death and he talked about it publicly on my, uh, on my, on my, uh, podcast, which is surreal to kind of witness and, and hear a female bounty hunter, um, uh, who I recently interviewed, who, uh, who also expressed a uh, veneration of death. Both of these people are Caucasian. They're not, uh, they're not Mexican nationals and I have see absolutely no issue or problem with it. Mm-hmm. Um, they are seeing in the faith practices coming out of Mexico an example and they're remembering their own relationship or past relationship that probably had through their ancestry of death. Nobody owns death, you know. <laughs> Nobody right. owns it. Uh, so it's, it's uh, and, and she, she sees on everybody's side is something else I've heard from the get. <laughs> she, so there she doesn't take sides. Um, nobody owns life, uh, but any, anybody that can hold a frying pan owns, can hold a frying pan owns death, you know. Mm. It's an aspect of it. So she's she's with everybody, and I think people looking at and seeing this, the ways that we do our our veneration in Mexico or saw elements of that are catching on to it and maybe manifesting it in their own ways, which is I think is a beautiful thing. Again, this shouldn't be codified. This shouldn't be owned by anybody. Uh, we are an example that is being now cast out out in the world, and people are seeing it and manifesting it in their own ways and I, I i think that's a beautiful thing um demonizing it selling it uh codifying it putting it into a book as a this is the way that it's done this is the way that we you, you should do it exactly is all against its basic tenets in nature uh and that's something i've been fighting against uh for a while now <laughs> again through both advocacy <laughs> Uh, speaking about it in any format that I can, and uh, being invited on to some of these people that are actually producing media to talk about some of the cultural sensibilities about some of these aspects and how it's depicted in media. It's something I've done, uh, and I'm continuing, and I'm going to continue doing. That's amazing, and I I, I think I, I join many listeners who you brought this up at on the last podcast that you know, for a lot of Americans at least who watch media. Watching Breaking Bad was one of the first introductions that you have to La Santa. But since then, because that was like 10, 15 years ago, in the media, in the work that you're doing, talking with people who produce media, who can document this, are you noticing a change in the media? Is it getting better in terms of the portrayal or is there still a lot of work to do? I, I, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah. I'm still like, hey, like, I've never seen... I've never seen my faith practice or the faith practices that I came up in depicted in media realistically. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen the iconography of it, but I haven't seen anybody you know, express it. I haven't seen a, a good character express it as a faith or mm-hmm. uh, it's always a villain. You know, the, I think the last time I saw something of this nature was in the bad boys movie, like bad uh, boys three. Oh, yeah. I almost, I almost threw my, you know, my soda at the, uh, at the, at the screen. Um, it is easy to vilify it because it's a little scary. I mean, death, who isn't, who hasn't been afraid of death once in their life. So it's the easiest villain to, to pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is, uh, it is such an essential aspect of our lives, <laughs> uh, that, uh, to deny her and to deny that death is real is, foolish uh every now and then i get people of the christian denomination and a few other people that attack me and say hey how can you 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 can't uh be serving two uh two masters it's like 
Uh, Jesus defeated death, and that if that's not an acknowledgement of her existence, even within your faith practice, then you're a fool. No, oh, but you're, why are you praying it to it? Like, why are you asking for it? It's a veneration of death in life, and it's a very real thing. You know, it's it, to deny death is hard. You know, you don't have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to prove to somebody that death is a real thing. Right. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> you, you know, Ed, too, you just brought up this important aspect about feedback and hearing from people. You know, you are kind of opening the doors for people and seeing the research, the the pictures, the posts, the media, which by the way, listeners, check the podcast and video descriptions below because we're going to link to both of Ed's um, accounts where you can see all of this wonderful um, practitioners delving into the tradition. Um, I think, Ed, this next listener question talks about this, this feedback that you've been hearing from actual practitioners. We have a listener question for you uh, from patron Andrej Nikolai, who is saying, Excellent. I've listened to Ed's first interview numerous times. Very interesting. Could you ask Ed his perspective on gatekeeping in Santa Muerte and in the community? I haven't experienced it, and my understanding of this deity is that she is universal, something, Ed, you've been mentioning this entire interview. And Andres is saying, I'm curious, what is Ed's experience? What has it been since the interview on Glitch Bottle and, and, and elsewhere, hearing from other devotees. Thank you for your work and content. I love listening to it on a rainy Oregon winter days. So um, it, thank you, Andres. And Ed, can you share about that? About You, you mentioned the feedback that yeah. people really are happy that you are actually setting the record straight on this too. I mean, it's not it's not like I'm setting a record straight. I think I think I'm clarifying things from a perspective of somebody that came from it. Yeah, because uh, right. I can tr I can trace back and prove my faith practice to my teenage years, uh, and I was a teenager in the '90s. And it's hard for other people out there that are now ex expressing themselves as authority figures on the subject to do the same um, mm -hmm. because. They didn't know about it or they didn't realize what it was or, you know, I, I, I could trace back my faith practices a bit, a, a little bit back into the past. And, and that doesn't make me an authority figure. It just makes me mm -hmm. somebody that, hey, I was there. I was an eyewitness for some of this stuff. And according to my eyewitness experience, the stuff you're doing doesn't make any sense, right? Um, yeah. I, I have experienced a lot of gatekeeping. Um, there are people selling online courses and books and stuff like that on the subject matter. And I don't recognize a lot of the stuff that we're expressing or, or, or speaking about in some of these courses. Um, that doesn't mean that it's wrong or, or evil or bad, but when you start getting people being hostile or protective of a certain faith tradition that they are protecting, that they inherited from who knows who, um, it's an insecurity aspect of it. I mean, people shouldn't be gatekeeping something that is real or public knowledge or or, or, or that should be public knowledge. There's no secret aspect of Santa Muerte that I can see now. Mm -hmm. All of it is all of it is open. There's no secret cult of Santa Muerte somewhere withholding withholding the secrets of it somewhere. What there is and what there was were different ways of expressing that practice and faith practices in the past that are probably that probably died out in different ways and forms. I mean, I went through the experience of being buried alive um, in a shallow grave as a as a, as a uh, as a sort of trabajo, where they were trying to confuse whatever negative entities are around us because we we're about to go do something really dangerous, which is work at the police. To confuse yeah. the entities that might do us harm by basically burying us, and now we're dead. And how can how can they how can you target somebody who's already dead? Right? I think that was the, the the purpose of that trabajo. That doesn't mean that that's how everybody went through it. That was an expression of a faith practice that died out probably in the past. And um, people now want to codify it and gatekeep. And this is, our, this is the, the truth of it. That guy doesn't know what he's saying. This guy doesn't know what he's saying. Um, it's been interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I personally don't engage with any of these people myself. Uh, I just speak, and the proof is in the pudding. Uh, I share everything openly on my Instagram account. I, I post everything that I find, I see uh, from 
uh, a few people in Mexico that are still kind of like trying to figure it out as well. Again, Espiral Morado on TikTok and on Instagram is one uh, is somebody that I would ask people to look at. He is going really deep into the mystical side of it. Mm. Uh, and he's shared some stuff. And the, he was the one that found that uh, telenovela mention and video of, uh, of La Santa Muerte. That's probably the first uh, time it showed up in popular media of any kind uh, in the 90s. Mm. Um, so my experience has been basically a, a, an experience of discovery. Um, I, I don't know everything. I'm still discovering some stuff and it's, uh, it's funny how since it was a clandestine behind the scenes, behind closed doors type faith practice, it, 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 you would assume that not a lot was left documented or left behind for future generations because that's how things worked, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm Things, things get passed on things got passed on in different ways and yes a lot of it died out um but it's hard for me to believe that there's uh people out there that are, that are keeping or guarding secret knowledge around it that have the true form of it that that doesn't make any sense uh going to mexico city going to zacatecas going to oaxaca or all places going to um uh, guadalajara and the witches market they're going to uh, those mercados uh, in in uh, Monterrey, speaking to Daphne, uh, speaking to Lisa from New Mexico, uh, going and experiencing the faith through my experience in Baja, seeing all these aspects, seeing all the different ways that it is, it's been expressed, you quickly realize that there is no way that somebody has all of it codified somewhere in a single source book or a single source expression. That's just... It, it 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 would be impossible, uh, I think. So um, a big aspect of, again, a big a big reason why I do this. Uh, one, it's part of my manda. It's part of the way I've been paying back what I I receive, which is an extension. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I do believe that I got an extension in my life. Um, and one of the aspects of this has been sharing some of these things publicly, even though it's brought me some pretty bad headaches and I've lost a few clients and I've lost a few relationships uh, around it from people that have absolutely no openness into accepting the fact that this is anything but an evil practice or satanic of some sort. Hmm. I've, I've noticed that with yourself, Ed, and with Doña Cueta as well, this um, amazing um, humility and also sincerity of, hey, um, we're not gatekeeping anything. We're just simply documenting. And I, I love every time I see one of your posts and listeners check the links below and I see Ed's field notes, I, I know I have to sit down and just embrace whatever that post is. And then the same with the Santa Muerte, because you are you are sharing this wonderful tradition without putting limitations or rules or, you know, there's a secret Bible out there. Um, one of the themes, Ed, in this show and previous guests have talked about it is for everyone out there who's worried, I need a, a Bible. I need a, a grimoire to explain to me everything. One of the things that many guests have said is if you're worried about that, don't be because the best teacher is your direct experience working with the spirit. So can you talk about for maybe listeners out there who are like, well, where do I start? What do I do? Can you share about how the best teacher is your individual relationship with La Santa? Yeah, I mean, volunteer work. Uh, <laughs> go, uh, like, uh, my that's the main thing I learned from my mother. And again, I was blessed with a, an amazing mother. Um, yeah. uh, I think she was the first one that basically made me confront reality. Uh, you know, we would go and uh, feed some of the homeless population in the Tijuana River estuary. And if you want to see death, I mean, you can see it there. Um, mm. And to see people who are close to death. Um, she was the one that, and, and also animals, you know, nature. Um haven't you ever wondered why you can have a baby gazelle and a baby leopard playing together sometimes? And it's like, wow, that's weird. Why are they playing together? You know, they're supposed to be enemies. Well, the reason why is because they're close to source. And the closer you are to source or the closer you are, are to getting back to source, the more beautiful and honest the expression of reality is through you. Um, mm -hmm. So children and, old, and, and, and elders are a gift and a teacher to us. Uh, 
mm-hmm. or people that are close to death. Uh, working in hospitals, working as a volunteer with people that are in on, in and on, on their way out. Um, if anything, the U.S. suffers from a distance and a coldness with their elders. Um, mm. You know, you you see uh, old folk, old folks' homes, and that blows my mind because um, I could never envision myself sending my parents off to live in somewhere where I'm not going to be able to see them. It's a very Mexican thing. We get made fun of that fact that we have a uh, six generation, uh, three generations living under one roof. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's that's a pretty interesting way of trying trying to start to develop a relationship to death in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, direct life experience and being of service to people will will get you close to that as well. Um, and community, uh, mm. we are a social animal. Uh, there's a reason why people gather to venerate in places and spots. Uh, I know that's not available to everybody, uh, but even in Mexico, people travel mm-hmm. to sites and to places. Um, I'm from Tijuana, Mexico, and I went to the Basilica in Mexico City. That's a three-hour flight um, to get there. Uh, and some people walk that path. Some people go on a bicycle. Uh, some people make their way there. Some people steal to get to, to places like that. Um I have a beautiful experience that I had probably this is two years ago. I went to visit my family in Colima. They live on a coastal town uh, in Manzanillo. Beautiful place. Um, I have a big family down there. So I have uh, seven cousins from one aunt. You know, if people have looked at my videos several times and I have a mustache and, and there's a, la- a short lady giving me the sign of the cross, that's my aunt. That's my aunt Chela. Ah, okay. In, in, in my family, the best and most powerful blessing, blessings are given by women in the family, not mm. the men, right? Yeah. Um, so I was about to embark on this project, and she gave me her blessing. And you can see behind her the the uh, angel Michael and Gabriel are behind her in this big statue. So it's pretty symbolic. Uh, when I went down there, I I, I said I'm going to dedicate a single day to each of my cousins because I don't see them a lot to get to know them. So I went to one who's a dentist, you know, and he's into martial arts and I, you know, fought him for a whole day. And then I went to another one who's a, <laughs> uh, who has a, who has a small business and he went to get tacos and he tried to get me drunk, although I don't drink anymore. So I was like fighting him off on that. Cool experience. Uh, one of the quiet ones, very religious. He was like, Hey, uh, like, um, this is your day. Like, what do you want to do? And he said, I don't know. I don't think you're going to want to go with me where I'm going to go. It's like, where are you going? He says, my son made it into the university that he wanted to, and I'm about to pay Amanda. Amanda basically is paying for um, something you asked for, and he's a devotee of the Virgen de Guadalupe. Mm-hmm. And he says, what's Amanda? You see that hill over there? Mm-hmm. Big ass fucking hill. Yeah. And he starts taking off his shoes. I, I'm climbing this hill every day without my shoes for seven days. I said, thank you. And this is the seventh day. So if you want, you can join me. <laughs> I could took off my shoes and, here, and there I go. Uh-huh. Um, wow. The getting up there, you know, minding my steps. And one thing I quickly realized is when you're barefoot in that gravelly ass, horrible hillside, you have a tendency to bow and look down and humble yourself. Uh-huh. Um, and you have a tendency to slow down. Uh, and you have to tend to look around. I started noticing that there was amazing, weird flowers that I've never seen. Uh, that there were some pottery, pottery shards from who knows what culture that were there. And uh, when we got up the, the hillside, there was a giant cross at the top of it. Hmm. And I felt no conflict between my Catholic faith and spiritual practice and a living veneration of life and death through paying uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe for this petition that my cousin had. And on my own end, uh, leaving an offering at the bottom of that hill in representation of La Santa. Uh, wow. I think that's how that's how people should approach this. Uh, there is no shortcut. There is no paying for the best statue. There is no paying for the best offering. There is sacrifice, service, and experience. This is a ride. It's a short one for some. It's a long one for others. It is what you make of it. And... What better 
company to keep beside you, then then who's going to be waiting for you at the step of those ladders when you leave here? You know, what a what a powerful story about humility and paying attention, and also, you know, the snake eating its own tail, the Ouroboros. You know, La Santa Muerte is a boundary. A, a kind of finality, but La Santa Muerte is also the genesis, the origin source from which all things spring. And hearing you, Ed, this is amazing because hearing you talk about, you know, in terms of ways to give back, again, community, service, volunteering, feeding the homeless. Um, I think this gets to the, a question about morality, even um, from one of our listeners. Uh, we have a listener question for you from Ana Victoria Esquivel Vasquez, who is asking and saying, Ed, if you had to describe Santa Muerte's moral compass, what would that description look like? Wow. Look, I mean, look at the savanna and look at nature as it is. I mean, you'll see a, a baby gazelle being eaten as it's being born. You know, what's the morality there? Mm. I think people are looking in the wrong place if they mm. look at her as a source of morality. Again, that's why Doña Queta uh, and a lot of the, the older school practitioners first ask God because, again, that's the way they divide that up, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they ask for order and then they venerate chaos at the bottom. And if anything, if, if anything, La Santa represents nature and nature pretty much is a divinity, it's feminine divinity. And if you look at different uh, thought process out there in the world, the femininity aspect is a chaos aspect. Um, so if, I don't think people should be looking for their moral compass or the morality within La Santa. That's not what she is. That's at mm -hmm. least that's what I've been able to gather on my end. Um, yes, there's certain rule sets and things you shouldn't do and stuff like that. But all of these are kind of basically common sense things, aspect that they express in nature. If you look at a troop of bonobos somewhere in the Congo, you'll see them express the same aspects of fairness, of community. Of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, and If you go into some of the most marginalized communities in the world, you'll see aspects of generosity, kindness. Um, you'll see flowers coming out of shit. <laughs> Um, you'll see. So, yep. um, I think we shouldn't look for our morality or human mor or aspects of human morality in, in, in her. That's not what she's about. Uh, she is a representation of the scary, uh, the dark, the unknown, the mm -hmm. void the source. She's chaos. Um, but when you, when you embrace it though, mm. you know, there's, you, when you embrace that aspect of it, um, and you're not afraid of it, and you welcome it in different aspects of your life, uh, you'll quickly realize and understand that both of them are part of you. You know, the order aspect, the other house you live in, the structure you build, the community, the morality you get from your parents, not from a statue, not from a deity uh, that is a, or a spiritual representation of death. Wherever you get your morality, you know, that's, I got it from, I got my guilt from my mom, you know, I got my charm from my dad. Um, I got, uh, <laughs> um, I got, uh, I got a lot of my spiritual, uh, my spiritual beliefs from Catholicism. I, I was raised Catholic. Um, I had a horrible experience with the church. Uh, and mm. I can, if, if you want, I can, I can share some of that. Uh, sure. sure. When my brother died, I was 13. And that put my mom into a psychiatric situation. And my, my dad basically went alcoholic. Um, my uncles asked a priest to come and talk to my parents about this loss. And he wouldn't speak to them because my parents weren't married through the church. Hmm. So that Man. made me pretty upset uh, and i got into uh i got into a conflict with that um later on my my mom looked for god in any way shape or form that she could find and a lot of christian organizations took her for everything that she had uh predatory you know just give us this and so yeah. that was my experience with that uh, and I'm not, and I understand, and I don't, I don't, I don't make the mistake of confusing men 
and 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 human beings taking control over uh, or an organized faith and being predatory right. with what is in the Bible and what aspects of the Bible are written by men and what aspects of the Bible are probably divinely inspired. You know, there's stuff in the Bible that I believe in and there's stuff in the Bible that I don't believe in. And that's pretty hurtful and harmful for, I think now in our day and age. Um, mm -hmm. I, when my brother died, I had an experience that, uh, you know, basically ended my childhood basically at 13 and I went feral. <laughs> I, I, I looked, uh, I looked for comfort in my mother, but my mother was gone. She, she, she died inside when my brother died. Uh, she, she went away in a lot of ways. Um, and I know for a fact that a lot of aspects of what I was looking for as far as comfort and direction and, and, uh, you know, I looked and seeked it out everywhere I could. And I, I think it, it was only till I, I met some of these women uh, that uh, introduced me into a deeper knowledge or concepts of what La Santa Muerte is. And I saw the example that they were giving me as far as how they would practice their faith about stealing a statue, you know, earning one and buying one and um, going through a process of death in life in a symbolic way. Uh, and through through some of the initiation rituals that they gave us uh, and empowered us uh, both spiritually and mentally to go into one of the most dangerous practices of professions there was at that time. Uh, and uh, I think that I found great comfort in that and realizing that in a lot of ways I refound what I was missing in my life, you know. Uh, the only, the only unquestioned and, and, and beautiful love that we usually have, and not all of us are lucky to have it or get it in, in our lives is that of a mother. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get it through your actual blood mother, um, it's a pretty, for me at least, it has been an amazing experience of finding it in a relationship to La Santa. Oh. If anything, it filled that for me. What a powerfully, gosh, just devastating hearing about your brother and your mother. And this might not be fair, um, but because as as you you said, uh, you know, obviously it's not talking about you know men in general. But would it be fair to say Ed, that hearing you describe this, it's like organized religion, the Catholic Church, has this very masculine aspect to it. Organization, hierarchical structures, the seven sacraments, and if you don't do this, you'll be in a state of mortal sin, and you have to say the Pater Noster and the Ave Marias and the Ro and all of this. But yet, directly opposite of that is, as you're saying, this feminine, right? Not Not as rigid with the boundary structures, showing you ways that you know, maybe here's a different way to navigate things. Would that be somewhat fair? I don't want to cast, you yeah, know, yeah. everything. I mean, but. most Catholics out there uh, have found in Mary, in the mm -hmm. figure of the Virgin Mary, a, a source of comfort more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty self-evident to anybody that mm -hmm. has paid attention and gone through life. How, you know, in Mexico is a pretty good example of this, how we, we recognize that in a deeper level through her, uh, or at least through what she represents, uh, mm -hmm. as a, you know, an image of a, a Madonna with a, with a child in her hands. And most people, when they look at that, they don't see the you know, baby Jesus. They see themselves in those arms. Um, mm -hmm. and yes, mm -hmm. I, I think there is a rigidity. And again, I'm, I've, I've, I have friends who are Catholic, uh, priests and I have, yeah. I go to, I go to mass uh, I'm baptized. Yep. I, I did my, my primera comunión. I've, and, uh, I just stopped bowing down at the whole of it. Mm -hmm. When I realized that a big aspect of what is probably wrong with some of these practices is the fact that there's men and women behind it and the ownership control and business aspect of it. Just like what is creeping now into La Santa Muerte and some of the practices around that has always been something that has um, 
reminded me of the wound that I received at 13 years old when I was denied uh, and my family was denied the basic uh, the basic aid in comfort uh, of one of the uh, one of the most painful losses I think anybody can have is the loss of, of a child. Um, and that's not a slight on the the, Catholic, the whole of the Catholic Church. They, they have a lot of sins beyond that, I, I guess, as an organization. Um, but they also have a lot of they also have a lot of things that have done uh, well and some mm -hmm. of the aspects of, of, of things that I that I that have uh, remained and 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 come to my life that are that are very positive. Um, I just realized at that with that experience that I shouldn't take the hold of it. You know, that's that right. it's probably that is probably on my from my personal experience. I at that moment I I clearly made that line in the ground, and I just decided not to be owned by it. Yeah, that's that's incredibly powerful words, and I I hope the listeners I, I hope you appreciate that as much as I do because I know in the kind of grimoireic esoteric tradition, the Catholic Church and and specific rituals are very important. But again, it's it's not. That doesn't mean you have to take the entirety of it and have this rigidity to it. Um, th thank you for sharing that, Ed. I mean, that's that's incredibly Saturnine, heavy, and and very powerful. And and I, I know that myself, and I hope the listeners really take that away about those those deep lessons that are embedded in that. Um, in addition, Ed, you in your posts in our last podcast, you have introduced me to so many different. Um, terms and traditions. And when I was talking with uh, Laura Davila as well, she introduced me. One of those things, and I'm, I'm going to quote you on um, Instagram, uh, when you mentioned that uh, this was in a past post, quote, one of the first Santa Muerte Dijes I got as a gift was from a fellow operations group member and follower. He told me that she is drawn sideways, walking forward and looking sideways towards the observer, as you mentioned, Ed, just a few moments ago. You say death walks with us, and if you are devoted to her, she will turn and smile at you during your journey as a familiar friend instead of behind you as an unknown enemy, unquote. So, Ed, can you just share for the listeners, um, what is a dije or a charm and, and how are dijes used in Santa Muerte tradition? So, I don't have that specific dije with me right now, but I have this one. It's a, it's a smaller one. It has the owl next to it. Um, oh, wow. Yep. Yep. Um, there's different kinds out there oh. and everybody has their own version. This one is beautiful because if you can see the background, it's basically a starry sky. Oh. And uh, when I was, when I was given this one, I was like, Oh, that's a beautiful image of death. And says, which one? I was like, what do you mean? So she's I was like this one. No, that's not that there's, there's another one there. And I was like, where? It's like, uh, she is behind the stars. So she's the blackness behind the stars, right? So Oof. she's the darkness behind the stars. So I was like, well, that's <laughs> that's a powerful thing. Um, wow. I think uh, I think with the with these and people basically use them as ways of carrying uh, her with you. Um, different different uh, things that I've seen. The one that I was given uh, that dije, uh, where she was basically walking sideways. Uh, the traveling Santa, as, as, as some people call her. Mm -hmm. um, when I was given that, it was it was cleaned by a lady. You know, she basically I was gifted that at a um, at a botanica uh, mm -hmm. center where basically people buy herbs and all these things. When you buy it, it's cleaned. Um, mm. From what I remember, it was a mix. It was some sort of rose water mixture that was used to clean it. Um, it was handed to me on my left hand. They usually give you things on your left hand because it's the closest hand to your heart because our heart is to the left. So it's the honest hand. It's the closest hand to your heart. So usually get, when you give something like this, you're supposed to give it to your left hand. Hmm. Um, the practice of these and the gift giving aspect of these is another aspect. It's another interesting, cool thing that I've seen as far as um, yes, this is a gift that somebody gave me. It doesn't mean that I have to be dead and buried with it. You know, I'm not 
smog the dragon. I'm not going to gather all my hordes with it. Um, this is designed and is supposed to be gifted out to somebody. So it's with me for a moment, and then I'm going to give it to somebody else. That dhe that I talked about, I gifted it to somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. We're not meant mm -hmm. to keep anything. So anybody hoarding, anybody trying to keep things with with themselves or treasuring aspects. I mean, I get the aspect of maybe inheriting it uh, to your to a loved one. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I uh, I have. Uh, a rosary uh, that I've posted a few times that is basically a, it's my mom's rosary and my rosary. So I, I, I've taken parts of her rosary and installed them, installed them in a, in a, it's, it's a black obsidian uh, rosary that I, that with silver that I got gifted. It's a beautiful one. Um, wow. So I, I put some of my mother's uh, dijas and charms that she has on hers on mine. And one day I'm going to give it to my daughter. And I don't know what she's going to do with it, you know. Uh, I, I get some aspects of that, but anything other than that, dijas, uh, small amulets with the protection uh, stuff on them. I mean, usually you have the uh, the tetragrammaton behind them, which is, is, is this protection amulet that is very uh, attached to Santa Muerte, probably probably from the starts of the eighties and seventies and eighties when it was introduced or it was used more and more in some of the occult practices of actual people practicing magic with it or people utilizing for uh for ritual um you started seeing its infusion the tetragrammaton into it basically this uh, protection symbol that is not related to anything native in mexico it's probably it, it comes from european sources um again um but uh what I've seen is one, they're meant to be gift. They're meant to be temporary or things that you hold with you for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, the imagery on them has, has varied. I've, I posted a bunch of them myself. I have one where it's a crucifix and La Santa Muerte standing in front of it. People think that's horribly sacrilegious, but it's completely in line with Catholic faith practices. Jesus defeated death and death stood in front of the cross. And um, so all of them are interesting symbols of faith and practices. They're meant to be carried with you. Uh, they're meant to be washed in the rain is another aspect I've seen people kind of mm -hmm. utilize and kind of practice with them uh, or or in river water. Uh, they're meant to be taken off when you're doing anything or practicing any, uh, when you're engaging in any sort of activity that uh, is, uh, how do you say this? What, when, you're, when you're having sex, is it's a, mm. it's a flip side of death. So you probably don't need to have that on. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. So um, it's like the inverse. Yeah. It's an inverse thing. So you probably take yeah. it off. I've heard <laughs> that's something I've heard. I don't know if it's a common practice throughout the whole of the, the fifth faith, but it's something I've heard. Um, again, it's meant to be gifted out. Everything's temporary with us. So things are meant to be gifted or, or, or given out in some darker aspects of it. When I say darker, I mean, practitioners or people that are related to risky jobs, people that are actually in criminal activities, uh, sicarios, people that are mm -hmm. in uh, in a war setting somewhere and in Mexico, they will take some of these dijas off their opponents if they, mm. if they, if they, they're, they're taken from people. Mm. Um, and it is not an insult. It is not something bad. It is something like, Hey, if I'm a devotee and I, there's another devotee on the ground and he has something of death with him. I will carry it on. And it's a sign of respect. It's not stealing. It's not evil. It's not bad. And I've seen this done a few times and it's something that I've seen and heard about. Uh, again, no books, no, no, uh, no uh, codified text, but this is some the practice that I saw and I was like, wait, what are you doing? Wow. You know? Yeah. So, um, because you don't want that to be taken and desecrated and or discarded by somebody that doesn't know what they, what it is and, and they want it to want it to be disrespected so it's actually a sign of respect to guard that for them after mm -hmm. they after they're gone um and uh some of these and, and realist one of the the real uh more so than Dk has one of the one of the other aspects of it that you see more and more now is tattoos mm. so body body ink and tattoos of la santa are, are very common and they were very common when I was uh, active as well. Uh, and those are, you know, those are on your skin. Uh, uh, there's no rule set about them. 
realistically and like everybody puts them on like i I posted a a video of a a grandmother with a a giant reaper on her chest it's spectacular spectacular looking i was like i I don't have the i don't have the balls to do that you know but amazing um amazing devotion again if people want to talk about devotion and how you practice i mean that's an example um there is there are many stories and rumors and stuff like that around it and i can speak on just my friends that work for the mexican red cross it is a running joke and fact that if anybody gets gets brought in there with gunshots or stab wounds that has a santa on them they have pretty good pretty good odds of surviving and that is a running joke and all and weird fact out there and people can verify it for themselves if they want to go down to mexico and ask this around i think there's some social media post about this as well um but it is a it's it's a weird aspect of it that people's possibilities of surviving a stabbing or a shooting increase if they have a santa muerte tattoo on no kidding wow so now that's even yeah like if you if you were to go through some of the numbers and kind of say wow the this percentage of people who need help or in dire medical condition if they have some kind of santa on them the odds are in their favor that they will be okay yeah, I mean, I, wow i'm not i'm not a numbers guy or nothing, yeah, but yeah. i've talked to a bunch of people that are in that that field and it's like a running joke that if the guy wow. that shows up has a santa muerte tattoo on possibilities of making it are, are increased there's a there's i think somebody out out there on on social media probably in spanish posted about this and people can find that somewhere on tiktok probably so yeah. i'm not the only one saying it it's i don't know i i think so we can equate it to actual magical protection mm-hmm. or we can equate it to strength of the mind and placebo you know mm-hmm. whatever you want i'm good with both uh, <laughs> um, i'm good with both you know what ed something you mentioned uh during our last podcast and you and i were kind of chatting about this is kind of your i don't want to say your personal definition of magic but you talk about this about the ability to bend the reality and bend probabilities to your own will, your own situation, and and kind of creating that reality. Can you just talk about when it comes to La Santa, how do, how do those two things interact? Like when you're engaging in a practice, do you wake up every morning and kind of approach it with, I am devoting myself to you. You are the boundary, but you're also the genesis and kind of put in your own intentions or how does that, how does that work? I mean, uh, the, 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 my, the way I think about it, it's like, again, I, I don't think there's anything outside of nature, so there's no, no there's nothing supernatural. Um, right. I think there's things that we don't understand, mm-hmm. and I think there's things that we won't ever understand because they are of a higher dimension in our plane. Mm-hmm. And people following the whole UAP phenomenon might kind of put some two cents into that, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, my experience with the divine, and that's what I call it, is through the bending of probability. And, you know, if, if if you see bending of probability around you, the, a number appearing many times uh, throughout your life, you know, my military service card has a 777 at the end of it. And so does my dad's, which is wow. insane. To, and I could take a picture of both so you can to prove it. Um, wow. but it's a weird, it's a weird coincidence, you know, coincidence. Yeah. Uh, you can call it coincidence or whatever. Um when I wake up every day and before I go to bed, I'm not afraid of death. That's not something that affects me. Uh, when I go and do something that people consider risky or kind of bad, like, Hey, like I went skydiving, uh, when I was still active and people were like, you already risk a lot and you're still going to go and jump off a plane. It's like, yeah, why? Well, the experience is amazing. Um, what if you die? I can die tonight if, by, by choking on an olive. I think this is going to be a way greater death. You know, when I was uh, when I was on Lex Friedman's podcast, he asked me, you know, what do you, what are you looking for? A good death, you know, a good death. Mm-hmm. If you can, if you can form a relationship with death in life and basically not have her behind you as a predator. But have her next to you as a companion. Things will change for you, and that might be mental. 
that might be a mental trick or a psychological trick of trick if people want to get at that get uh, turn it into that but you see it expressed in many people across history uh um, Miyamoto Musashi, the famous samurai, uh, Japanese mm-hmm. samurai, would say, seek death, basically, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, this aspect of having the uh, having death as a as an inevitable element in your life and also as something you're not afraid of or worried about is liberating. It is one of the biggest chains that we have on us mentally and spiritually, I think. And Religion, organized religion, hangs that shit over our head a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, the promise of a reward after you die is, I think, one of the most poisonous aspects of organized religion that I that I've managed to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, rewards and punishment are here now, and it's a it's a fallacy to think you're gonna you're gonna receive it somewhere else. And we need to be good and present, and like now, you know. Um, yeah. During during the uh, during some of my during some of my my own personal experiences uh, on uh, mind altering substances that I that I went through, uh, one of the truths that I I don't know if it was you know one thing one thing I want to make clear I don't think that there's a skeleton lady in the sky with a robe right watching out for me I don't think that's that, that's basically the way that my human brain can make sense of something that is higher, uh, that is in a dimension that I can't comprehend is to encapsulate it into an effigy of a sort. That's what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that came to me in a, in a, in a dream vision that I had uh, was her saying, what's the only no, what's the only eternal thing that you can know about? As a human being, mm. <laughs> is a question <laughs> that she posed to me in this wow mind altering state, and I was like, I mean, try, try, what what answer would you have to that? My goodness, I, I I can't even begin to apprehend how you would answer. What what is the only thing that you can know eternally the, as a human? As a what's human, what's the being? only what's the only eternal thing that you can that you can comprehend as a human? My goodness. Um, just off the top of my head, I mean, I I want to say something like death, but that's an ever present companion and it's something that you won't experience till you go through it. So I I don't know, Ed. My goodness, how did you how did you answer that? What the heck? I, I didn't. I was quiet. I was like, <laughs> okay. Quiet. Yeah. Um, okay. Wow. The answer the answer that came to me in that dream was now. It's always gonna be now. So basically, it was an invitation to be present. Wow! And if you're present, yeah. you're not worried about death. You're not worried about being born. You're, you're. It's now. Uh, mm-hmm. And there is a power in being present, and not being avoidant, and not mm-hmm. trying to run away from shit, or not trying to run towards shit. That's the illusion. Mm. So, in a lot of ways, when you're in front of your altar, when I'm doing my practice, when I wake up and put incense up, uh, when I clap three times to invoke her, um, when I change her water, I'm being present Mm -hmm. with death. And I take that aspect into every part of my life. When I'm with my daughter, I'm with my daughter. Uh, Mm -hmm. when I'm with my friends, I'm with my friends. And when I'm without, when, when I'm alone, I'm with myself. And for a long time in my life, I was running (laughs) from myself. Uh, uh, I was running into alcohol. I was running into bad relationships. I was running into a bunch of shit, uh, that was pretty detrimental to me. And it's only when I got that vision of her asking me what the only eternal thing that we can perceive as humans is. Uh, and she said presence basically now it's always going to be now. It uh, dawned on me that uh, she gave me something pretty powerful with that. Maybe it was her, maybe it was myself. Maybe it was an enlightening, en- enlightening uh, moment that I had for myself. I don't know. Um, when people talk about my experience with the divine, or when people talk about my experience with 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 that aspect of my spiritual journey and stuff like that, or in theirs, I always ask them like, "What did what did she tell you? Give me a secret, right?" 
And I said, this is mine. You know, this is the, this is the biggest one she gave me. So I hope it helps somebody out there. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been life changing for me and, uh, people that are know me that have been around me have, that have seen me being public with it and also have seen me focus on it and utilizing it as a personal practice. When people see the stuff that I post and, and I share some of me venerating, uh, I share some of my pictures of my altar and videos of my altar. When people see all of those aspects, all of it is symbolic external work of things that I'm doing internally. That's all mm. it is. I'm not, I'm not trying to manifest a million dollars in, in my bank account or um, I'm not trying to call upon her to take vengeance for me or anything like that. I'm, uh, I'm working some things out internally in her space um, mm -hmm. and uh, externalizing some of these things in the form of objects, uh, a, a, a water, a, 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 a cup of water flipped upside down on top of a, a plate. Uh, having water inside of it is a symbol of an eternal symbol. So it's, 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 it's speaking about eternity, mm. um, burning a candle that consumes itself is another symbol of life and death. Mm. Um, having incense and or smoke coming up is a symbol of air and uh, basically mm. being able to flow. Um, water and the purity of water and keeping that purity is work, constant work mm -hmm. and being ever vigilant and again, being present. The reason why you're not supposed to leave water out and make water go bad on an altar is to be present. That's the reason. It's not about, she's not going to be able to drink the purify, the, the, the dirty water. She's going to be upset about it. No, it's, she's just asking you to be present. That's all it is. Wow. Those those three three letters, you know, N O W. Now it's about being present, and and as you've said, Ed, just uh, just to reiterate this, you don't limit that to the altar. That's feeding the homeless in Tijuana. That's cleaning graveyards. That's leaving cigarettes out for people to take. There, all of that is is all of that part of the manda, part of the yeah, giving back, yeah. part of that service. Yeah, I mean, if you if you live a life that is not, I mean, sometimes people people look at my life and they say you're lucky, you know. Like you have this, you have that, and you you're doing this. Like, uh, like I have some celebrity friends that I hang out with every now and then, pretty big ones, and they're like, "How did you get there?" Right? Or I have uh the the opportunity to go to places and people just open their homes to me, and mm -hmm. I don't I'm, I'm not home. I I sometimes make make light of the fact that I'm kind of homeless, <laughs> uh, but I have a bed everywhere that I go. And it's because I've managed to reach a bunch of people and a lot of people have connected with me through my experience and how open I've been with sharing them. And that's my blessing. You know, it's not luck. It's being present. It's being, being active. It's working and it's taking, uh, it's taking a bad experience that I've had for the past, since I was 13, when I, I think that's when it started for me, mm -hmm. uh, to 39 and, surviving it and now trying to make a positive out of it. Um, and I think that's the arc that a lot of people go through in their lives and people that don't go through that arc are avoidant, won't go through it. And they'll, uh, they're already dead in life, you know, in a lot of ways, but not, not, not in a, not in a positive way. Right. No, you, you are somebody and I, I, you know, just from all of the content that you've shared at the interviews you've done, you are somebody it seems to me who has come out of the darkness and who has been empowering others to transmute pain and loss and difficult times into service and into these kind of jewels of healing and redemption. I mean, that, that I, I really am struck by that as well, Ed, is just your ability to, I mean, do you, do you feel that when, because you must get people all the time, as as you said, you know, if they're you know, celebrities or Santa Muerte practitioners, and you mentioned Lisa Martinez, like there's so many people coming up to you when they offer that feedback or when they say, like, I, I've heard from thousands of, of listeners talking about, my gosh, this is so amazing that Ed has, you know, is sharing this and is being open about it and is connecting the dots. When you hear that praise or when you hear that feedback, does that 
is that also an element of that service? It's like, I'm just giving, I'm just giving back. Is that how you see it? Is I, I don't know. Um, uh, we have a, uh, we have a charity we run called the fighter's kitchen. Uh, it was started by my business partner, Keelan. Um, she's, she was a, she was a professional Thai boxer in Thailand, which is insane. You know, it's pretty, she was, she's a, she's a badass. Um, and, uh, Damn. This uh this this program uh, was started by her and Eddie out of a uh, out of a, a, a gym called uh, Puerta Escondido Muay Thai, and they're basically a fighting a very famous fighting camp. People come from all over the world to train there. Um, but one thing we asked them was like, "Are you supporting the locals?" You know, and they are. And some of these kids have they don't have a lot, but they do have a dream, and their dream is to fight. <laughs> And there's something about that that is very reminiscent of me. Uh, when I went through my loss and I, the only way I could express my pain and anguish was through fighting. Mm. So we basically feed them uh, while they're going through, the, we, we nourish them while they're going through their training. Um, you know, you can, I, I can see positive things that I do and, and positive effects that it has on people. My reward is seeing people like that grow because of some of the horrible shit that I went through. Uh, again, the flower coming out of the shit. Mm -hmm. I'm the shit. They're the flower. And if I can grow flowers out of myself, it's the best thing in the world. That's my reward. Um, I, I, there's, there's no better way of describing it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Uh, I think Lisa's the one that really opened that up for myself. I, I didn't understand. I was running and trying to figure out a way to save myself or find somebody that would save me, you know, or or take away some of the pain that I had going on uh, since I was a kid and then going through the PTSD aspect of some of the shit that I had to go through in later life, then alcoholism, then divorce, then all of these aspects. And uh, I, I quickly realized that I had to become what I would have wanted to show up at my house when my parents uh, lost my brother. That's who I needed to become. If the priest isn't going to come, who would have come? And then I realized that I've been basically constructing and building the person or the man that I wish would have come to my house to talk mm -hmm. to my parents. Um, that was my arc. That was a snake biting its tail moment that Lisa gave me. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the reward. You know, becoming what you would have wanted, uh, planting trees that you're never going to sit under. <laughs> uh, that's uh, uh, all of it is going to be enjoyed by somebody else, and I mm -hmm. am happy about it. That's it's it's the it's a victory nobody can ever take from me. You know, you can go into fucking living on the streets and be a bum, but the flowers are always going to be out there somewhere. And I think that's the best reward. I don't know who said this quote, but it just reminded me of, uh, I think it was a philosopher, but someone said that death is only the end. If you think the story ends with you, you know, it, yeah. it if it, but it doesn't end with you and it, it goes on and on. And, um, gosh, Ed, talk about coming full circle. Um, this actually goes directly to something you've posted about before regarding being the person who showed up since the priest wasn't going to show up, you know, uh, after the death of your brother, uh, you actually spoke about, um, the Dia de los Muertos, the day of the dead. And you've, you previously said, quote, that when it comes to honoring ancestors, you say our dead have many lessons to give us still. Sometimes the only way to listen to them is by remembering them, their songs, the foods they liked, and the stories they left us. Somewhere in there, they speak, unquote. So to to that point about being being the man, being the person that you want to be and have to be to show up, how do you honor? Can you share with listeners some, some different ways that you honor? I mean, there's so many, I'm sure, the departed family and friends in your life. I mean, this is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Many, many people that have died and are, are somewhere else now are not going to be able to speak upon what is being done with some of the practices that they helped to make survive till now. Mm -hmm. So that's one way I honor my ancestors. Um, I always try and 
take into account or see or look at joys that they had in life and to share some of those joys and explain what some of those joys were. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother was an amazing marksman. Uh, he would shoot a can. He would he would toss a can into the air and make it make it dance in the in the, in, in the air. Uh, wow. He was also a ladies' man. <laughs> um, <laughs> he had three girlfriends show up to the uh, to the uh, funeral, claiming to be his girlfriend, which is he was a he was a he was a character, and uh, hmm. he was the first man. And he died when he was 19, so he he was always going to be bigger than me in my mind. But he was the first man that I saw uh, dance with a woman and having the fact that he was dancing be a masculine thing. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think... On my end, I remember having this moment of like, "Gosh, I need to, I need to learn how to dance," right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I take every opportunity that I can to dance. Um, there are not a lot of them out there because women apparently forgot how to dance, or uh, and men uh, and men have forgotten how to, how to dance. And some parts of Mexico, I still go, and there's they're still dancing in some parties and stuff like that. And I make it a point to always invite people to dance. Um, the fact that I share certain types of music and music is a big part of an aspect of the way I communicate uh, to people is part of that. And every single song that I share on there is a memory of a sort of a different person that I've had in my life that I've lost. And they gave me a gift of a beautiful song or a mm. dance or a joyous moment or a party somewhere. So every time you're hearing some weird song out there uh, that I post up on my Instagram account, it's probably related to somebody I lost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even when I uh, <clears throat> when I went on the uh, the Joe Rogan podcast for the second time, people can see I'm wearing a black T-shirt that says "Jaramillo Lives." Uh, that was a friend of mine that I work with uh, who was. Pretty. Uh, I shared some stories about him. He's a, he was a pretty shady character. Um, but when I was going through hell, you know, God chose to send me a devil to guide me through, not an angel, and that was him. Um, mm. So a lot of a lot of the popular music that I post up on the uh, soul music, Al Green stuff, that's him. You know, that's him speaking. Uh, we are walking backwards into the future, and all we have is the faces of our ancestors to tell us and guide us through. Um, I know a lot of people out there in the U.S. are suffering from this lack of culture, is what they say. Or at some point, there was an, um, a cultural amputation of a sort. People are don't know who they are, mm -hmm. or are struggling with identity. Uh, that's why identity politics are so powerful in the U.S. I guess. Uh, but uh, I think one of the big aspects that people look at in Mexico, there's not not a lot of things that uh, we don't have a lot of things. Uh, socially right now going for Mexico like there's a, bu there's a bunch of issues we have and, and, and systemic corruption and all that but uh, we're pretty close to the dead and we have a great relationship with our ancestors mostly and I think you could see that in the way we party <laughs> and in the way we dance and in the way we enjoy and have laughter even with sorrow uh, mm -hmm. la malegria as, uh, as Manu Chao says malegria which is the, the bad sorrow like a the bad, the bad joy, the the hurtful joy, is a big aspect of that. Um, the detachment of death, the seeing a dead, uh, the seeing a dead relative in a box, embalmed behind glass, the not being able to touch them, to kiss them, uh, to dress them before they get sent to a funerary service. I've I've done all these things for my dead, not just my family members, but also members of the group that I work with. So I have a very close relationship to that. And I know that's missing in a lot of people's lives. How do you honor the dead? How do you honor your ancestors? Again, La Santa could be the veneration of a death uh, spirit, or it could be a legit veneration of death in life. And that comes also through being somebody that's capable of speaking at a funeral, you know? Uh, mm. Who are you? Are, are you capable of speaking at, uh, at your parents' funeral? I have. Uh, are you ready to share a moment with the dying and comfort them? I have many times. And it's not something 
I would have wanted to go through without being prepared for it, but I had to learn. Um, you know, I ask people this question every now and then during some of the training that I do, because I, I do a lot of weird training where I show people how to weaponize their environment, how to survive in pretty hostile environments. I've trained the military, I've trained some special operations people, mm -hmm. uh, reporters and stuff like that. One question that I ask everybody that stops them in their tracks is, this guy gets shot in the face. This guy gets shot in the both of his legs. He's bleeding out. He's going to die in a few minutes. What do you do? And I've seen millions of dollars worth of government training in the form of elite special forces operators go dead silent with that question. What do you do? And trust me, if you do nothing, that will haunt you for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, mm. So what do you do? And I, when I get asked that question, I said, "What do you want to leave behind for your for your for loved ones? Take out a piece of paper, start writing it down, and if you don't know how to say the holy mysteries, find an alternative of comfort and words to say to these people because they are going to go. And what in you are going to be the last thing they see and, and experience here." What would you want that to look like? And if you haven't transformed yourself and who you are into being that, then you need to do some work, I guess. Wow. Those precious moments, leaving somebody, be, literally being almost for, for many of us unimaginable, but can you be there, whether it's a family member, a friend, a military situation, that is such a perspective shift, Ed, that you just shared about you literally, your your words, your face, whatever you're sharing with someone, you could be the very last physical thing, presence, spirit, person that that person sees before they transition. And, and also, you're going to be the last echo of their voice in their family's ears. Man. Are you ready for that? And again, mm -hmm. people ask me, like, what value is it that you pray to this death deity? <laughs> Or why is this death veneration and why do you use this iconography all that much? One, it's powerful. It's real. And if I didn't have that with me, I probably wouldn't have made it through. Mm. And um, if I can bring any lessons that I learned through it and having it as a faith practice is that it got me ready to face death. Um. It got me ready to accompany people through that process in horrible situations that I, I still carry with me. And uh, it uh, made me appreciate life more and it made me realize that I'm still here. Um, and uh, it made me appreciate things way more. Um, and uh, things taste way better. <laughs> uh, sun, sunshine is way warmer. Um, and you see the positive in some really, really dark places. Um, it's if, if if you can if you can just take, get that veil away from you. Uh, and again, I've seen this practice in the different formats of it in different cultures out there. Nobody again, nobody owns death. Uh, but if I think uh, the way that I've approached it and the way that I've seen some of the people that showed me this practice approach it, it's very much a memento mori. It's very much a having death in life and having her close and having a relationship with that and not having it behind you as a predator, but beside you as a friend. Mm. Uh, that is, that is so powerful. I, I remember Ed um, many years ago when I was a news reporter, uh, I shadowed um, emergency workers and fire workers, EMTs on the night shift. And I, they let me go in to see some, you know, pretty serious car accidents, fatal incidents, overdoses. And yet when I would go in there and watch and talk to the crews, it's exactly what you're saying. The people closest to death, they were some of the most compassionate. They found the bright spots, not in, of course, what happened to the individual, but in embracing death and being close to that. So can you, can you talk about that? Because for all the listeners out there, for the few, I, I hope, who are thinking, gosh, this is such a heavy topic and it's so 
I hope I never have to deal with that. You're saying, Ed, no, it's the opposite. The more you embrace it, the more you understand it, the more you face that reality, you actually become more jovial. What'd you say? The the sunlight is warm and food yeah, tastes sun. better. I mean, the sun is warmer. The rain doesn't ruin you. You don't open your umbrella. You get wet. You just walk, <laughs> you know? Uh, I don't... I, uh, <laughs> You know, one of the big aspects that like, people that need to watch out for people speaking about or trying to own death as a faith practice, ask them what services they've done with the dead or how close they've been to that process themselves. Mm. Um, I, I think the, and it's not, I don't, I don't, I don't think people should seek it. You know, they don't seek death, I guess. Um, but if you if you find yourself in a life path that that is part of it, and again, I have a lot of friends that are in the military, and I speak a lot to people from that pro, from that come out of that uh, community uh, with issues, PTSD, and um, other issues that stem from it. Uh, we are a species that our main predators are ourselves, and there is a horrible conflict in our souls because of it, probably. Um the the aspect of survive surviving something like that or or going through something like that trauma trauma of all kinds i every now and then i get asked to assist with exposure therapy with people that have gone through traumatic experiences related to being restrained or being abducted mm. or being put into confinement people show up to classes with those experiences beforehand and they want to figure out how to get over it and i always tell them like I mean, if you have something you fear, that fear and whatever that is is going to own you until you, you know, face it. Um, showing a lady how to open a padlock that was attached to her ankle, keeping her somewhere where she was tortured physically and mentally for a while mm -hmm. and having her open a padlock with a bobby pin. Um, she cried for a while, I remember. It was like, how oh, was that easy? I said, no, it, it is that easy. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that easy. It is that easy. Not, but now this is not going to be an issue. You're going to be, you're not going to, you're not going to suffer with this again. You have already figured this out. It's like, okay, so what can I do with this now? Show it to everybody around you so nobody suffers the same fate. Mm. You know, that's how, that's what you do with mm -hmm. it. Um, if you can, if you can figure out how to, if you can figure out that that aspect of it, that's amazing. If you can basically weaponize the the tool that was used against you into empowering other people, again, we're social animals. So that's a big part of the healing process for people that people miss. People want to heal by themselves and alone in the hole. That's not how we're wired. <laughs> um, we heal in community and we empower others. That's how legit. If you want to get over your own shit, focus on other people. You know. Mm. That's 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 one of the big lessons that I learned on my end. Um, having those experiences, being close to that type of stuff, you enjoy. I mean, there's people people uh, people have seen emergency service members or people that are coming from the military that show up in a town to party for a few days have have experienced what joy and pure expression comes out of these people. Um. There is a, there is definitely an aspect of joy uh, mm. and 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 uh, jubilee that comes from being close to death, um, that could quickly lead to you going quickly out of life <laughs> and stupidity. Uh, but uh, there's also an aspect of it that makes everything worth it at the end. Um, I've, I've I've gone through this 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 life path that has basically been one test after another i guess um people seeing me now and hearing me and seeing me out there and meeting me out there that have no idea what my life path has been specifically and uh, and some of the pain that lies behind me and that i still carry with me i'm not you know that i think one of the biggest lies that gets told to people is that they will get back to normal there is no normal <laughs> Yeah. Or that they will get better. You know, what is better? There's no definition to that. I think uh, we learn to live with it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I miss my brother every day and I'm never going to get over it because he was that important to me. I miss all of my brothers that I lost in that stupid war that I was a part of. 
because they were that valuable and important. And I celebrate them through my work and through the, the things that I do. And to be a voice that is still here. I'm the echo of their voice to their loved ones, I guess, in a lot of ways, or and to people that might need some of that information and some of the experiences that they had. And having a relationship with death in life has been uh, a, a very powerful thing that I can lean on and and focus on while I'm going through my own healing process. I mean, staring into the void and not blinking is a skill, you know? Kneeling, kneeling in the middle of a dark room and staring into a candle and having that light burn into your eyes is an example of uh, what a faith practice is. Uh, people want to look away. People want to avoid. People want to close their eyes. They can all they want, but eventually, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to have to face it. Um, so again, this this whole aspect of, of what death and veneration of death brings to your life, uh, it brings a flavor to things that you've never experienced. It uh, it brings a purpose. It brings a finality. Uh, it brings a, it knocks the stupid uh, sense of immortality that some of us have in our minds for some reason that uh, gets uh, put into our, our heads by different faith practices and people that want to control us and manipulate us. Um, it's a powerful thing. And there's a reason why it's vilified and persecuted that much, because I think people are aware of the liberation aspect that it gives people. Every, every post that I see of yours, Ed, not to get too poetic about this, but you, it's, it's like you're presenting these luminous wounds. You know, your, your, I, I, when I read Ed's field notes, when I see your posts, when I see you, know, you just recently posted, uh, there was a dog waking up in a grave, right? And you were you were tying that into, you know, death and now and the present moment. I mean, every single time that I see one of your posts, it is it is a luminous wound, but it's also I feel it's a pointing for others to say, "Hey, pay attention to this." You know, is there some learn from this? If if you're in a similar situation, you're not alone. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you must hear from people who uh -huh. share that. I've, I've, uh, I'm part of a weird, I mean, not weird. I mean, it's a very vast community of instructors and it's a tactical community. And a lot of these people come from the police services, a lot of ex-military people, uh, and masculinity and manning up and running a thousand miles every day and getting up at three in the morning and lifting weights and all that is there. And I get it. I'm right. not any of that. <laughs> I'm not any of that. I, and I do work out and I do push people to strive to be better and all that strength, all of that is great. Yeah. Um, one thing I realized quickly is that not a lot of these guys like to speak about or talk about the other aspect of it, which is loss and damage and pain and trauma and alcoholism and divorce and PTSD and not as a catch-all term, but like legit not being able to confront things that remind you of a horrible experience that you had or um, not being able to face things of that nature and hiding it and keeping it under wraps because you don't want people to see it. You want people to see you smiling. You want people to see you as a strong reference of a man and being macho and just kicking ass and taking names and all that. Um, I hid it for a long while mm. while I was coming up in this uh, industry. Um, I was teaching and doing my thing for years before I popped into the major uh, podcast and stuff like that where I started blowing up. Um, but I, always, I would always hide that aspect because I thought people were going to treat me weird or differently or going to discount me as somebody that is capable of showing them anything if I showed them any sort of vulnerability or showed them aspects of as you say, a wound. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at a random fucking gas station somewhere, the restaurant, it was a bar somewhere. I read on the wall, it was written on a wall, fucking bathroom walls. I've, I've read some gold on them. You know, if you want to, if you want to speak to God, it's usually in the bathroom wall somewhere. Um, you can't pick pocket a naked man is what it was written on that fucking wall. Right. Um, and I said, fuck, you know, wow. I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying everybody get naked, you know, if, if you're into that, you're, 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 you're whatever. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 
I was, I was, I was deadly afraid of people seeing that. And, uh, mm -hmm. so I just started being public with it. Uh, the, uh, the fever dreams that I started to share were all directly from directly sourced from therapy, uh, mm. journals that I was keeping. I started going to therapy, uh, and I started being public about the fact that I was going through these aspects. I started going through sobriety and people saw me in my times when I was drinking and I would post videos of me fucking chugging a beer and shit like that. And then all of a sudden it was like, fuck, I have to now talk about, um, I'm going to not only go sober, I'm going to do it with an audience to keep myself honest. And also to, if I go sober just for my own purposes and intentions on my own quietly and just make my life better and nobody fucking um, it's just my own that would be great mm -hmm. but if i could do something with it and i've gotten hundreds of messages about that aspect of my process and sharing and how that's helped out a bunch of people still like two days ago i got this whole giant message on my instagram account about somebody who was going through their second year of, of sobriety and thanking me about it um wow i, I, I don't know awesome. how to take some of that sometimes because it uh I don't know. I, I, I have, I'm not too good at that. I need to work on how to receive some of those uh, comments, I guess. But uh, you can't pickpocket a naked man was one of the moments of enlightenment that I found. And the other one was I struggled for a long while thinking of myself as a good person or as anybody that was worth anything because of what I had to go through and what I had to do. I did a horrible job in a horrible place and to this day, I get called all sorts of horrible names and and and, and, uh, and assumptions about what I did and how I did it. You know um, that I was a corrupt police officer in Mexico. Although people that know me and were with me, uh, and I have a bunch of character weakness. I, I had I had Lieutenant Colonel Izaola, who was one of the most in, like, legendary. He was yeah. there on my podcast, and he would have never taken my fucking phone call if I, if I wasn't somebody who was clean. Um, I realized quickly that, uh, that, uh, I saw this, um, a person of love has to be a destroyer. It's the absolute essence of the universe written on a fucking bathroom wall somewhere else. Oh, right? uh, and I, re and I realized that both of them are necessary. Mm. Like I, I can't, I can't be who I am if I didn't have that. Right. I had to have that aspect of it. And again, going back to the whole duality aspect of life and death and having a Santa Muerte on one end and having La Virgen de Guadalupe on the other, they're both they're both elements. You know, I think the secret is that uh, it's, it, people are concentrating at the statues of the images of La Virgen and La Santa Muerte, and they're not concentrating on the background, the blackness behind the stars. That's, mm -hmm. that's who she is, and that's who we are in life. We can't be defined by good or bad. We're we have to be all of it, you know. And that's why you that's what you don't find in organized religion. And that's that's what you find right. in it elsewhere. Right. Marrying the contraries, you know, embracing the paradox of death. Ed, that is that is incredible. Um last time, Ed, you mentioned that silver, and you've mentioned silver as well here, that it is a memento mori that police carry around and the silver stays in their pocket or it ends up on their eyes when they're dead, this kind of, you know, paying the boatman, so to speak, and class classic mythology. But you recently posted a few months back about silver saying, quote, I had this vision of myself once paying a ferryman on a shore in silver for each of my ancestors that could afford the crossing. I like to think of myself as the one in my bloodline to finally bail out the rest, generation, course, and all. I guess in a way, silver represents redemption for me and them, for what I have accomplished in life and feeling grateful for their influence in who I am now. So, Ed, I guess this this is, um, I guess, a pretty big question, um, but to kind of follow Lex a little bit. What does redemption mean to you? And do you feel redemption is an ongoing process? What is redemption? I think I think a, a main thing that people will try and do is think that they are going to be the redemption. Uh, that's not how it works. Um, 
I no longer drink alcohol, and I am free of the church that for many of my ancestors' generations was in control of both how they would view the world and how they would view themselves. And I'm not saying I'm better than any of them, but uh, if you want something to strive for, you, you know, the wildest dreams that your ancestors have, you'll manifest them in your life. I no longer drink alcohol. And that's weird for my family because <laughs> these are a bunch of drugs. Um, I, most of my family members were pacifists. Uh, and they mm. weren't, they weren't that fighter. So I, I looked for a fight myself. Um, my mom grew up in a horrible household with horrible parents. Mm. And she taught me the time that I had her completely. She taught me how to be a good parent. And I always ask people, if you want to judge me in any way, shape or form, meet my kid and ask her what opinion she has of me. And that's the best judge of character that I can give anybody. Mm. I, I said, I want to go to the shore and fill that boatman's hand with all the silver that my ancestors could not afford to pay him. Generational curses are real and they exist and they're real. I mean, people want to talk about supernatural shit. Uh, it's, there's nothing outside of nature. Uh, if you want to talk about what aspects of La Santa and this faith practice that I've took, taken and have bettered my life, that's one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Realizing that I can save my ancestors. How? Making a better future to for my daughter. If you don't have kids, that doesn't matter. Who's around you? Who's going to be left behind? Are their lives going to be better because of you? Or are they just going to continue on with your weight? And you're just going to, instead of giving them silver for the ride, uh, instead of uh, silver for the ride, you're going to give them a rock, mm. a weight, so you can sink down to the ocean. And what are you going to give them? Um, I think a big lesson that I got from my mother, because she did her best, and she was hit with something that I can't imagine. Um, so I, I, I don't have any blame for her, but I... I had to go through it, you know. And that was my process: losing my brother, then losing my parents, and, and and losing somebody that's still alive is way more painful than just having somebody die. Is something I learned from that experience. Um, I had to figure out how to make a positive out of it, <laughs> and it's hard, you know. It's talk about mental gymnastics, uh, trying to justify all of that, and. On top of that, my experience uh, growing up basically alone on my own. Um, on top of that, going through a war that I went through. On top of that, losing uh, uh, a marriage that I didn't want to end. And, and I just I was abandoned yet again. Um, and on top of that, uh, going through a reinvention and a rebirth in the United States, trying to figure things out uh, on my own and then finding people along the way on a similar path and just figuring out how to make a positive out of all of it. Generational curses are real. And if you want purpose in life, people are always uh, complaining about purpose. What's my purpose? I don't know what my purpose is. If you want a basic one, you know, save your ancestors, you know, be better, figure out ways of not passing on that ball and chain that they, they gave you. Uh, I'm never going to live to see the fruits of that. My kid is. And that's everything. Sorry, man. You, you kind of make me tear up. It's uh, it's incredibly powerful to, to hear you share that um, because it's just death and trans transmutational change comes for all of us. And so I, I very much appreciate you sharing that. Ed. That's, that's incredibly um, powerful. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, last question for you. And I think one that's important for um, all listeners and most certainly myself. And it's something I saw on your Patreon, which by the way, listeners check out below. It's an honor to support Ed. Please support Ed on Patreon. 
He has amazing posts. He has amazing um, observations that are accentuations of and go beyond just you know the posts that you see on Instagram. His Patreon is amazing. So we'll link to that below. But on Patreon, Ed, you said this. You said, quote, one big lesson, <clears throat> excuse me, one big lesson I took from some of the men I apprenticed with was this simple truth. Slow down every now and then. Slow can be hard for some of us. Mind you, I'm not saying stop. I guess for me, you say, Ed, slow has always meant working on personal endeavors, self-development, and quality time with the people that matter the most, unquote. So, Ed, as we, uh, we're going to talk about places people can find you and everything else, but as we wrap up the podcast, can you just share with our listeners why is slowing down so important? Uh, I think, uh, again, this whole aspect of death being a destination and or being behind us uh, is, is part of it, um, that we are going to walk into a room that is happy and we're walking towards our happiness or running towards it like a lot of people are or we're running from some shit that happened in our past and we have this trap that we make for ourselves where we're running or we're hurrying towards or running away from something uh, I've, I'm, I've been guilty of that almost my whole life uh, um this whole aspect of her sharing this truth of being present and that being the only eternal thing that we can have in this life. Um, I have a saying that I post constantly, stillness is death. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is something that I've carried with me a lot. Like, oh, man, being still, you can meditate and be still with yourself. You're wrong. Not when, you're, when you're meditating, your heart's still beating. You're still breathing. You're still... Your body's still going. Your, your your processes are still happening. What I mean by that is, uh, we're not a fixed point. Mm -hmm. uh, if you did something horrible in your past, that's not who you are. Who you are is what you do with that, and how you transform from that. Mm -hmm. You are who you are as you go. That's who you are. Happiness is in a room that's waiting for you somewhere. Happiness happens during the walk. You know, uh, there is this trap that we fall into when we're walking towards running towards or running from things the the most difficult thing we can do sometimes is slow down and be with ourselves um when i talk about development and a big aspect of what i do for people is i skill sets survival learning how of them to be self-capable independent how to take security into their own hands these are self-development aspects that I wish I had when I was growing up. I don't know, I wish I had somebody who's taught me. Um, my biggest gift in, uh, that I've had was having some amazing mentor figures. Among them, this character in the name uh, by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Ola, who went on my podcast, and people want to find out a little bit about him. Um, if you want something to strive for, is to become something like that for other people. And he gave me that gift. At least, uh, at least he showed me how to how to approach that. Um, hmm. Nobody's going to come and save you. There's nobody going to come in and and fix everything for you. There's nobody cares. You know, nobody gives a shit about what you're going through. Um, it's up to you to swim. If you fall in the water, uh, it's up to you to stand up. It's up to you to keep walking forward. The the I've tried battle with depression for years I've, I've just gone through I've, i'm going through it right now uh people can look at me and like oh you're fine i just went through my third december on my own because of the nature of my my life you know and also because i don't have a family nucleus that i would want to have i just don't have that so there's pain in that i could either sit with it and remain here or I can figure out ways of climbing myself out of that proverbial grave that I've walked out of a few times before in my life, including when I was uh, presented to this faith practice. Um, I think there's a lesson there for others. Um, we're not a fixed point. Uh, it's the main one. Uh, you, you, what your, your past doesn't define you, and also your future doesn't. What defines you is what you do with it now. That's who you are. Mm. Don't hide from that. 
Uh, inc- those luminous wounds uh, continue to shine. This is uh, you know, the the last time we had a podcast that I, I I heard from many many listeners and myself. I had to sit with that and listen and re-listen, and I'll certainly be doing that now. Um, Ed, as we as we just wrap up here um, below. Ed Calderon's Patreon, please support Ed. You'll see a link to Ed's uh, Manifesto Radio podcast, which is so good. And the guests are so varied and it's approaching things and accentuating Ed's experience, law enforcement, the cartel, Santa Muerte, talking with different people, different issues. So check out that link. But Ed, um, where else can people find you? Do you have any classes coming up uh, about your website? Anything and everything. Please feel free to uh, share. Number one. Uh, if people can go on our, uh, our our YouTube channel and look for my interview with Lisa Martinez, mm-hmm. who was has been, there's a whole interview with her on there. Basically, we're talking before I go into a session with her. It's our platica, which I don't know if people realize that's not something usually shared or published by people when they do that. I wasn't doing it for any other reason to just, hey, I'm going to be openly vulnerable with my process. And I'm going to hand myself over to this amazing curandera by the name of Lisa Martinez. She's amazing. If people want to learn about that process, and it it's an amazing it's an amazing conversation. I would ask people to go there and look at that if they're interested in my process. Uh, www.ed's manifesto. If people want to find out more about the training we provide, some of the courses we have, um, and our media side at Manifesto Radio Podcast. And we have, specifically, I'm focusing on people that have, you know, died and come back to life in life. Uh, People that have constructed themselves and found purpose in rebirth and and reconfiguration and transmutation, as you say. Uh, That's the main objective of that podcast. I've had some amazing people on there from former SEAL Team 6 guy who now runs a, a a program called Heroes for Horses that relates to getting people back from uh, active service that have PTSD. I'm probably going to go through that process myself at some point Um, to people like Josh Burnett, who's an amazing human being (laughs) and uh, a a fighter and an amazing uh, heart on him. And people of that nature is usually one of who I have on there. So it's a I always tell people it's a companion piece to the training we provide. Mm. Learning how to fight and learning how to make weapons and learning how to survive in horrible situations is great, but learning from people that have actually gone through it themselves is amazing. That's how I did it. And that's why I share it uh, through that podcast. Manifesto radio podcast on Instagram. If people want to follow my social media presence, I Mm -hmm. it's a, I'm an open book and I share most of my process there. If people want to know what's going on in my head, they usually think you just go there and see what's going on with me. And finally, specifically related to this, uh, this, this conversation, uh, La Santa y el Monje at, at Instagram. I am sharing everything I find that I think isn't being paid, that isn't out there that much, or not being as far as the folk practices, iconography, imagery, statues. Uh, my personal altar is, is shared there, and uh, things that I want people to know about and express about. I'm not gatekeeping anything. Everything right. is open. I'm sharing everything freely. You don't have to pay a subscription to do any of that. Everything is there. Um, and I'm fighting tooth and nail to keep it that way. Uh, I have been working on a on a book, but that book is basically whoever wants to get it. It's cool, uh, but it's basically a collection of some of these aspects that I've seen. It's not a manual. It's not a, a, a it's anything. It's basically my personal devotional journal in a way and how I've gone through it myself. It's not a set list of things it's just my experience with it and just like this conversation has not been a manual of any kind or a delineation of any kind this is just an expression of the fact that death in life is a very good relationship to develop and that nobody owns it and people out there trying to make it their own or trying to own gain ownership over it are doing a great disservice to people and i'm here to kind of clear the waters on that Breaking the misconceptions, casting those deep, luminous gems in this dusky cave we call life. Um, It, wow, uh, deep lessons. And I hope that you, the listeners, appreciate as much as I do. Instructor, um, warrior, 
devotee of Santa Muerte, Ed Calderon. Ed, as always, it is a true honor and a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and uh, sharing with the listeners on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Thank you so much. Thank you. 